Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We got a return guest with Derek Frank. He's an incredibly talented bass player, over, great guy. Uh, Derek was on the show a while back, and what I'm going to do is, in case you didn't hear his original interview on the audio and the video today, we'll, I'll put the original. Uh, he's got a new album out. It's called 11 Years Later. Everything about it, even the packaging, is like so freaking cool, man. It's funky as hell. It's got a ton of grooves on it. And, uh, man, thank you for putting this out and thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me and thanks for listening. You're welcome. It was, it was a, cool. a true pleasure. Um, quick announcement, make sure you get it. Everyone loves guitar.com forward slash subscribe and subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the little widget, the little thing on the side, looks like a uh, bell, a little emoji that helps us get recommended by YouTube. And I appreciate your support on that. Quickly about Derek, uh, originally from Pittsburgh, he started playing bass as a kid, eventually went to University of Miami. Oh, that's why John DeFaria is always on. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, he's, me, he's, 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 well, I'll let you continue and then no, I'll go ahead, tell go you ahead. about the thing with John. Well, John and I went to the same high school and college. Interlochen? Interlochen, yep. Yep. Oh. And we, we, didn't, we didn't know each other. We're a few years apart, but yeah. um, we met at like an alumni function. Like, oh, okay. That, that's how I met John. And and then we've done a couple of things together in town. In LA. Oh, that's cool. He's a buddy of mine. I speak to him quite a bit. And he's always like, oh, Derek cool. Frank is awesome. Good yeah. guy. Okay. Yeah, yeah he's a really good guy. Uh, he then moved out to LA after graduating University of Miami and has since performed in 25 countries and 48 states on tours with various artists and bands. He's currently Gwen Stefani's bass player. They played the other night on, was it Kimmel? Uh, Fallon. On Jimmy Fallon. Uh, he's been, and it was a great show. Uh, he's been Thanks. with Shania Twain for five years and the L.A. based rock band, the Dirty Diamond. Man, this seems like through COVID, like when you say these bands, it's like it's like an old memory. That can, I, yeah, <laughs> it's terrible. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Memory came up recently of a Dirty Diamond show. I think the last show we had was yeah December 2019. So yeah, a year ago. Oh, man. He's also part of the Soundcheck Live house band at the Lucky Strike Live in, in Hollywood. If you don't know about that, that's like where all the top players go to hang out and jam. He's also toured with Shakira, Air Supply, Mindy Abair and the Bone Shakers, Daniel Powder, Victoria Justice, Jeff Golub, Dancing with the Scar st Scars, Dancing with the Scars, <laughs> Dancing with the Scars, like and the, the, and <laughs> Dancing with the Sars, <laughs> <laughs> Dancing with the Sars, yeah, for the COVID COVID edition. <laughs> Brian Augers, Oblivion Express, uh, and others, and he's been with uh, Brian for quite a long time. He's had one-off performances, including TV shows with Poe, Alan Parsons, Greg Raleigh Band. Christina Aguilera, Keb Mo, Jennifer Page, and others. And he's played bass on over, it says 40. That's got to be like 50 or 60 uh, albums as a session player. Mm. He recently released a solo LP called, again, 11 Years Later. Let me just tell you, this is no bullshit. This guy is super talented. He's an incredibly nice guy. He's an excellent songwriter. And I was just blown away. And I was, I mean, I would love everybody to listen to this, not to help Derek. I mean, I'd be thrilled. But for your own listening, for your own edification, to use an SET word, um, it's just a great record, man. Thank you again for coming on the show. For Thank you. That. Thanks for all the kind words. Yeah, man. Let's just it's easy to be honest, you know. Um, right on. This is like a proper. Let me pull up my iTunes here, man. This is like a massive record. Twelve tracks, um, over an hour. What? And it's funky as hell. What made you put the, what, how'd you get the motivation to put this out? Because, you know, most people now are making EPs or releasing a single here and there, but you went balls to the wall. Yeah. I mean, there's different strategies these days and people say it's all about singles. And so a lot of people will, you know, keep releasing singles and then eventually put them together in an album. I, I just kind of wanted to go more old school with this because I knew I wanted to do it on vinyl. Um, I just, did, I, I don't know, in doing instrumental music, I, I, I still, not sure about the whole single thing, you know, I, when I think of singles, I think of like hit singles, like a something, you know, that and with instrumental music, I don't know. I just, I just haven't really jumped on board with the single thing. Maybe I will in the future, but for this, I just kind of, I don't know. I, I kind of wanted to do a 10 song record and it just kind of went from there. There were a couple other things I wanted to add to it. Um, so it, it, it originally was a 10 song record, but then I had a, I put a bonus track on there that I recorded about six years ago, which is this, uh, a cover of Stevie Wonder's All Day Sucker. It was just a fun little thing I did with yeah. uh, Herman Matthews on drums, and it never found a home on a record. So we put that on as a bonus track, and then we just had some great studio chatter during our sessions. So I had the engineer. That was cool. Like, it was fun. I, yeah, there was yeah. Just some great stuff, like, you know, before and after takes. 
and so I just I had the engineer um put together like a little two minute or whatever it is uh just think of studio chatter that I don't know I just thought it was too good to not put it, on it was there. great so that, you know <laughs> that's what? an additional track as a listener I I love that because you get behind the scene you know like people are interested in 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 you like the musicians what's going on mm -hmm. here and it's uh it's a secret mystery for people that don't know how this gets done and i i thought that was really cool because it feels like oh man these guys had fun you know yeah, it just opens yeah. it's like insight a little bit and and i love hearing that like that you hear some records that have a little bit of that on there like obviously with the beatles you know you'd you'd hear you know hear those guys messing around and it was always hilarious and great to hear them just messing around in the studio there's a bunch of examples of that on their records um and, and, and also these days, you know, like a lot of times records are just made by people passing tracks around and everybody tracking by themselves, you know, like it's, it's rare to actually get a band in a studio and play yes. together. And that's where you get all those funny moments where like somebody messes up and you're all, you know, falling over laughing about it, you know, and making jokes about it. And that's kind of like what we did, you know, it's just where we were four guys in a room playing music. And of course, like every now and then somebody makes a mistake and y'all laugh about it and, you know. And so we got a lot of that recorded and I just thought it'd be fun to, you know, include that on the record, you know, it was more of just kind of like a, a throwback sort of thing, you know? Yeah, it was great. And just so you know, it's funny because people, a lot of musicians come on the show and they'll say, Hey, you know, I'm in the middle of an album. What do you think I should do? You think I should release singles? And I'm like, man, I wish I knew. I don't think I don't know. I mean, matters. I, I, I don't I think, think it, it's still the wild west out there, you know? It, and just for me, the way I like listening to music, I like listening to albums. You know, I do too, and, man. And maybe that's not the norm, and especially for the younger folks. I don't know. But I like listening to full albums top to bottom in the way that the artist or band intended for the listener to hear them. I mean, yes. you know, albums are sequenced in a way that, like, it's intentional. You know, it's telling a story. There's an arc to it. Yeah. And I love listening to music that way. So I just kind of figure when I'm making music, I, I, I want to put it out that way as well, you know? Yeah. And I think people will just pick their favorite songs and maybe add a single to a playlist here and there or whatever, you know? People can do that, you know, but, but as I far agree. as like, you know, me making a record and the intention of it, I just, yeah, kind of want it to be a, a top to bottom kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And a lot of times people, the question I get asked is, well, when they say, what do you think I should do? I'm just like, honestly, unless you have a massive social media following, it's not, it's not going to matter. And even if you have a massive social, what's your end game? If you're trying to make money with this, good luck. It doesn't matter if you release a single a week or a month or, yeah. you know, a 12 song album like you did, it's probably not going to happen. You know, you're not, yeah. I, you're not releasing this to make money. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the wrong reason to make an album these days because, you know, people don't really pay for music that much. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, I, I wanted to make physical product just because I like physical product. Again, it's like I'm I'm putting it out there in a way that I like to listen to music. Like yeah. I did vinyl and I did those little USB drives for people that may want physical product but don't Dude, have a turntable. this is the coolest thing. I was so stoked when I, I was like, I never got an 8-track. And this is now my 8-track. <laughs> this is so it's, it's pretty funny. I mean, it's like, you know, I kind of figured I could sell little USB drives, but... It's not really that fun. It's just a little thing you put in your computer. Like if I can package it with something like that, that's kind of retro, you know, 70s. The vibe of the album is pretty 70s anyway. So it's great. packaging it with with these uh, eight track tapes, it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, this is not inexpensive either. No, I de it, it definitely cost me some money. You know? Yeah. But yeah, it was money it's... well spent, you know. But it's, I had it's some savings and uh, it's, yeah, I I regret nothing. <laughs> Good. It's really it's really awesome. Really, I love the uh, the even the this one I thought was real clever. The the you have the outline like it's an old like record that's been sitting in your thing. How did you come up right. with that? That was really creative. Where have I seen? I think just by looking at records, just like looking through records, like any uh any records that you've had for a long time it does that like you get that sort of like worn circle around in, yeah. in the in the uh, sleeve like kind of where the disc is it's like if you're looking through any old records you you see that it's just typical i just thought it was kind of cool you know and i was it's like you know so what? cool because i'm going for kind of a, a a 70s vibe a little old school vibe and that's just what kind of what i like i like you know vintage and old school instruments and you know, recording gear and all that just kind of wanted to bring that to the album cover as well it's so in fact i think it was funny yeah i uh for whatever reason when i downloaded this 
the cover didn't come out, but uh, fortunately you had sent me the cover. So I went and uploaded you know, to iTunes, that cover, because I'm like, I want that one. I don't, I don't. Oh, did it not? The cover didn't come up on iTunes. The artwork didn't come up. I don't know why. Yeah. Huh, it, weird. It, you know, and it, maybe it could have just been me or my computer. I don't huh. know. So it, but, it is uh, there now. The, okay. I mean, the good. artwork's there. The PDF booklet is not for some reason, like iTunes, you still can't uh, upload a PDF booklet. You used to be able to. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe it's different for different distributors. I, I've been using DistroKid, and like when okay. I did it with them, they said we're unable to include that. So mm -hmm. that's another reason why I wanted to sell the USB drives, because it has a, a PDF booklet of, of the album art, all the photos. Like, it's, it's the album cover. You know? Right. That's what I got. I have them still on my computer. I liked it. It was really cool. Yeah, the cool. PDF was awesome. Cool. Thanks. Um, Man, so 12 tracks, over an hour music. You had a lot to say. You got nine originals, right? And three covers? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Originals or, yeah, I know three, Josh. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, had yeah, some co-writers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, three covers. Yeah. Uh, was there any kind of like overall theme or message for the record or? I don't know about theme or message. I just, um, you know, I've got a lot of different influences and I wanted to bring all that uh, to it. So I think overall I wanted to go for something that kind of had a 70s sound to it without being like a caricature. It's not like a 70s disco record. It's not like a, it's not done yeah. in a goofy way, but I think all the influences are are, are, are pretty 70s on it. Um, and I kind of wanted to just go for that, but but genre-wise, it's kind of all over the place. You know, I mean, I'm, I, I love listening to and playing so many different styles of music. So all of that kind of came into the songwriting for this. Like I've got bits of funk, I've got bits of blues, bits of Southern rock even, some like riff rock stuff, um, some jazz. It's got a little bit of everything. And that's just kind of what came out in the writing, you know? Um, in, in preparing for the record and in preparing for the writing, I just made a big playlist on Spotify of like all the different influences that I wanted to bring to it. And it's kind of all over the place. Um, and so cool. I just listened to that playlist a lot. And I think just a lot of that just kind of seeped into my brain. And just as I started coming up with ideas, it just kind of, I don't know, just kind of took on that eclectic, vibe where it was just kind of all over the place but you know sonically it's just kind of you know rooted in the 70s so when for this record you wrote you used like these playlists as idea prompts in a sense mm -hmm. that's really interesting do you normally write like like do you also like just not i didn't really do that for my first record um i i, I honestly don't write a lot i need to do it more because i really kind of uh, developed more of an appreciation for it in this. Dude, you in need to do record. it more because you're really good at it. That's Thank why you. I, I, have. I, I learned to enjoy it more. Like I've always been in my career, I've always just been a player and that's kind of what I did and what I've done. And I've, I haven't really done a lot of songwriting per se, like as far as writing, like, you know, stuff for other artists, I, all the writing I've done has just been for my own projects. Um, and the first process was different. I didn't really, um, I don't know. I just kind of came up with ideas and, in, in you know, just develop those. But for this new record, I kind of had, had some targets in mind, you know, like some specific sounds I wanted to, or styles that I wanted to incorporate. And that in the playlist that I, that I built, it had a lot of John Schofield. It had uh, some meters. It had um, some Thundercat, some Wolfpack, some uh, Tower Wolfpack. of Power, some uh, Black Crows, some Government Mule. Uh, Dumpster Funk was in there. Just, uh, you know, very yeah, much groove driven stuff. all of those things though man For sure yeah, yeah. cuz i you know i didn't want to make a bass album i'm not really like like a lead solo bass guy it's not really what i do and it's not really right. you know what my career is all about so um you know that wasn't really what what i was going for i just wanted to go for a vibe and and as far as like where the focus lies on my bass on this record it's more about the parts and the tone and the interaction within the band more than solos. You know, I'm, yeah. I think I've got maybe three bass solos on the whole record. You know, it's, it's just more about a, you know, a, a band vibe. It's interesting. Cause one of the questions I had for later was, I thought you did a great job showcasing the bass, but it wasn't a bass album, as you just said, but I thought you did a great job of moving the bass into sort of like a co-lead instrument with the guitar or with the keys because yeah, it's a good way to put it like a co-lead yeah it's kind of yeah it's kind of what it is because i mean it is featured you know in some capacity just because i'm a bass player and it's my record and yeah and, it, and it's wrote, appropriate but... And, but but it was it was appropriate in the songs as well um 
And so my question about that was, so like you still kept the songs on the pedestal, but it was just your support of them was greater than, than like a normal bass uh, player's role. Did, did that come naturally in writing or like knowing that, Hey, I want to be more of a co-lead. Did you have to like, was that a challenge in, when in writing to keep that in mind? Uh, I, I never, I, ne I was never really thinking, okay, how do I make this a co-lead? I think, okay. I think, Hmm. I think a lot of it just came up with me playing bass grooves first and in playing bass grooves, I, you know, I want to play things that are interesting and not just me, you know, just writing eighth notes or, you know, the, the kind of things that I do when I'm playing with an artist, like being a supportive bass player. I wanted to do something that made the bass stick out a little bit more. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was cognizant of, of featuring the bass in some capacity, you know, featuring my instrument. Um, but I figured the best way that I that I can do that for me and, and for my style of playing is make it, like I said, more about the parts and the tones rather than, than all the notes, you know. And, and I think my, my parts are maybe a little bit busy because they can be, you know, because it's my solo album, you know. So, you know, well, they're also, a little bit busy, but, but they're not super flashy, you know. But also the reason why it works is a lot of times when people do that, they do that at the expense of minimizing the other co-lead. Sure. You didn't do that at all. The guitar, no. Josh, Josh, you did a great job. It's Joshua Ray Gucci, and he's been on the show, goes into his interview. You did a great job on this record. Um, and I don't know your keyboard's name, your player's name, I'm sorry, but uh Ty Bailey. Ty Bailey did a great mm -hmm. job, and you did not minimize those guys. No, not at all. At I mean, all. And I think the songs that I wrote, they don't, you know, they weren't really the songs I wrote didn't really lend themselves to bass melodies. So it's, yeah. so in that way it's like it. I, I, as I wrote the songs, I was just kind of thinking, okay, this, who's going to play the melody on this? This could be, you know, organ or guitar, you know? And when I was writing, I just kind of like pulled up logic patches and I would, you know, play some, you know, oh, cool. guitar patch or organ patch and kind of figure out what would, what melodies would work with what instruments, you know? Yeah. That's, you did a great job. Um, okay. So you said this was, where was this recorded? We recorded this at, at Plyer's studio in Santa Clarita, California, which is Jim Scott's studio. Uh, Jim Scott is the producer. Uh, he's produced and engineered just tons of amazing records. He's, you know, a, a veteran of the business and he's just got an awesome studio that's just, you know, completely, you know, it's analog, vintage, just vintage instruments, vintage console. Um, I mean, of course, he does use Pro Tools, but you know, we we didn't go to tape. But you didn't go to tape. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, aside from not recording to tape, everything else was like pretty much as old school as you can get. You know, he That's mixed cool. just on the console. Nothing was used in the box. You know, I think there are very minimal um, effects from from uh, the computer. I think it's mostly outboard stuff. A lot of pedals. You know, a lot of the delays and things you hear from Josh are, are pedals. You know, um, and same with same with myself. You know, so. It's all vintage instruments, and that's kind of that's what his cool. studio is all about, and that's why I went there. It's just, I mean, the place is amazing. You know? he, he mixed it as well? He did. I mean, we, yeah. we did everything it's, top it's to bottom. Great, just did great his job, place. Nick. He great has an nice. assistant uh, that does all of the engineering and all the Pro Tools work. Um, Jim produced it, mixed it, you know, hosted us at his studio. That's cool. And, uh, it, was, it was a really fun, fun way to do it. Any uh, special guests on the record? We had a few special guests. I mean, the core band was myself, Joshua Ray Gooch, as you mentioned, Ty Bailey and Randy Cook. That was the core band. Um, we did have Joe Bonamassa play guitar in one song. Uh, we had my my buddy and old Shania Twain bandmate, Jason Mowry, play Dobro on the same song. Um, so they th those two guested on a song called Onward. Hmm. Um, Jason played some tasty little, little Dobro parts, and then Joe just played a ripping guitar solo, as as you would expect from Joe Bonamassa. <laughs> um and then uh, I had a horn section play on three songs. It's a, it's a horn section named the Fat City Horns, and they're from Las Vegas. And they play every, you know, when it's not a pandemic, they play every Monday <laughs> um, at a club there. And it's like the total musician hangout and just killing band, killing horn section. Whenever I'm out there for my residencies, like if I've got a Monday night off, I'm down there checking them out. It's called Santa Fe and the Fat City Horns. So when I did the record, I knew I wanted some horns on some stuff. And so I talked to their arranger Nathan Tenoy and asked him to arrange some horn parts and he did. And so, yeah, so got the horn section. Um, also I had my buddy Catisse Buckingham play flute on the first track. He's the 
the, the most amazing jazz flute player that I know. He's incredible. Uh, we used to be in a band together, and he's uh, one of his claims to fame is is that flute scene in Anchorman where uh, Will Ferrell busts out of a flute and sits in with a band. That's him. That's that's him playing. Yeah. <laughs> What's his? That's a cool name, Catiz. Catiz Buckingham. Yeah, yeah, he's incredible. Is he like incredible Lindsay? Producer. Related to Lindsay? He's not. No. Uh-uh. Yeah, I'm sure he gets but, asked uh, that a lot. But man, great, great musician. Um, also on that song, Get Him, I had my buddy Carlos Lopez play percussion. He's another Vegas-based uh, musician. He plays in one of the Cirque du Soleil shows out here. We used to do, out in Vegas, um, we used to do the Dancing with the Stars tours together. He was in that oh, band cool. with me. Um, who else? I know I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, Herman Matthews played drums on the uh, on the bonus track, All Day Sucker. That was recorded in 2014. Herman, of course, from uh, Tower of Power. Right. Played with them in the 90s. Um I think who, that might be it for guests yeah who played drums on get em? that got that was so aggressive and so <laughs> tough i mean it, that was really difficult to do that's man. that's randy cook Man, and, he, uh, he he's could... he's in the core band he's on uh all the tracks except for the one with herman and Wait a randy's How do I know incredible that name? he's man he's he's he, he'd be a good guy to have on the show he's played with tons of people he played in a ringo's band for a while which that that says a lot for a drummer yeah. to be playing in ringo's band uh, played with Dave Stort for a long time from the Eurythmics. Yeah. Um, Colby Calais. It's a b- big session guy. Does a lot of sessions. Um, he's been in Smash Mouth for a few years. He doesn't like to mention that these days just because they're, you know, I don't know. They're taking a lot of heat for some of the bad decisions. That Are they? <laughs> the what happened? Making. Well, oh. they, you know, the, the singer's just got some issues and he's, there's, you know, been a few viral videos of him acting like an idiot on stage, you know, and insulting the audience things like that and the latest yeah. one was uh they That's... played a big concert at sturgis with like all these unmasked people and you know he was saying like you know fuck covid and all this stuff like just not, <laughs> not portraying himself for the band in great light so i know uh wow randy, randy doesn't really like to be associated with that although here i am on a podcast tell <laughs> mentioning smash mouth but uh, <laughs> anyway that's just one of his one of his uh i know his, i've heard his, of him before yeah. man He's yeah great. i know i've He's heard great. his name mentioned several times that's yeah. fun uh it, I know another guy, Sean Hurwitz, is in that band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's interesting. Yeah, that's never good to insult people that are paying you money. I don't know. I'm kind of old school like that. <laughs> yeah, there was one of like, yeah, I think there's been a few instances of him just refusing to go on stage too and like canceling the gig last minute. It's been some of that stuff. Like, now the singer's got a few issues. I don't mean. Yeah, to I was going to say that sounds I don't like mean to be good. bringing yeah. attention to that though. It's not my not yeah. my place. <laughs> no, man, it is what it is but, though. But you know, yeah. 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 Um. I, I talked about this with you before. I rarely ask about uh, titles, but 11 years later, it sounded like a before and after testimonial. I thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. And the origins are? Well, my my first and only other solo album uh, came out in 2009. That's called Let the Games Begin. Um, yeah, so I I didn't do another solo project. You know, it took me 11 years to, to finally jump back in and do that. Uh, so it seemed like an appropriate title. Yeah, I, I love it. Hopefully, we won't have to wait eleven years for the next one. Man, this is no, really I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing some more this year. Like I, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to do a record. I think the way I want to do it now is write some more songs, get the band playing live, and then, you know, w- work out the new songs live, and then go into the studio. You know, Good. I mean, I love the way we did it this time, but I'm I'm just itching to play live. You know, and and. I don't think there's a need for me to get another album out within a year. I think, you know, absolutely, if, man. You know, I think if I that's... go two years between albums, you know, and maybe we just drop some videos of the new songs in between. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, but, but I am going to, I'm definitely going to do an, another record within the next two years. I hope so, man. Cause you, you're a great, your songwriting is really good. And I, I just love the musicianship on here. Thank you. What was the most, you're welcome. What was the most enjoyable thing about playing your own music versus playing as a side man playing someone else's music it's just it's just exciting to hear something that you created come to come to life you know i mean I, you know I, I spent you know a couple months just hunkered down at my house in la just coming up with ideas and like making these demos that of course i would never release i'm not really a keyboard player or a great drum programmer so i'm just making these rough demos and logic that i'm then sending them to the guys and uh just to hear those demos come to life you know is is pretty cool and that's super exciting to hear something that you created, you know, out of, out of nowhere, then come to yeah. life and, and, you know, sound like something, you know? And, and of course it allows me to kind of bring all the different styles and techniques and sounds that I enjoy using, utilizing, but, but, but I might not get to utilize those things with some of the artists that I'm 
that I'm playing with because I'm yeah. just there to support them and play their parts. Um, so it kind of allowed me the freedom to like kind of play what I want, you know, yeah. play how I want. And it, and it was great. Uh, did you learn anything from making this record? Experience? Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, what'd you learn? You know, well, it's just um, I, I, I learned to enjoy songwriting again. I, I learned a lot about like my process and what works. Um, and, and that was really cool. It just it kind of allowed me to tap into something and kind of figure out, oh, okay, like this is what, I need to do to like get some songs out and you know learned that um definitely got you know learned a few things in logic and making my demos and all that um and it, it just made me maybe just learn uh kind of what what i want to do as a bass player moving forward like what i want to accomplish like i i want to keep doing the gigs that i'm doing as a side man i love mm -hmm. playing with shania and gwen and and getting to you know do that stuff it's it's incredible and i love it but i think also i i learned that um that, that I'm really happy playing my own stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. happy creating my own stuff and right I, I want to do that moving forward. You know, I mean, like we said before, it's not, it's not about the money. It's, you know, it's impossible to make money doing that, but I, I want to do it for myself. And I just, I learned that that's uh, a, a part of my musicianship that, that I really need to um, keep doing that kind of satisfies my soul, you know? And I'm really happy to hear that. Cause this was just, it was a joy to listen to. Uh, let's talk about some of the songs, my favorite songs. Uh, I already talked about Get Them. Great funky song. Great. It was, you know what, too? And this is always tough, man, to open the record. It, it's probably an exacting process. To, how many nights you go to bed thinking, man, maybe we should put this one first. And I, I would mm -hmm. imagine that's tough, no? This one was actually written to be the first song in the album. Oh, okay. I, I don't know if you've gone back and checked out my first album, but- I the, did the, not, but I will, the, I'm sorry. Well, the, the first track on that, it's all good, but the, the first track on that is called Breakout, and that's another kind of 70s cop show sounding song. Yeah, that's and what that, it's- Yeah, that's and, what Yeah, I mean, and, and that wasn't really written with that intention, that song Breakout. It was just, it's kind of like what came out, and it just seemed like a, a good way to start that record. And I just, I just love that vibe. And I've been, I've been watching a lot of seventies TV during this pandemic and I, I love seventies TV. I love the music. It's just so great. And it, and in doing that, I was like, you know what, I'm going to write another seventies cop show song. I think that could be a thing for me where, where I open every album with something like that. Dude, you that know? would be so even, cool. I mean, I've even thought about doing a whole album of that. Cause I, I, I love that music. I love playing it. I think there's room for so many interesting parts bass wise guitar wise horn wise um so get em was like it was written with that intention i was like i'm gonna write a 70s cop show awesome theme song and that's gonna start the album <laughs> phenomenal what a great way to start because i you know uh, one of the things that i've been fortunate is through doing through the show i've gotten turned on to so much new music and i've learned to think mm -hmm. about music differently through talking to all you guys and I realize how difficult it is to set up a schedule for how, which songs. And so when I listen to albums now, I never, I would just listen to the music. Now I'm like, wow, what a great placement for a first song. You know, I appreciate the work that goes into that, man. But you got to put thought into it. It's like, like I said, it's like a, there, there, there's an arc to it. It's like, you know, I, I kind of feel like it's good to come out slamming and then, then get in and then, and then keep the, keep the listener engaged and then eventually break it down. And if you've got like a, you know, more of a ballad or a mellower tune, um, which for me is actually nine songs in the song onward with, with Joe. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like pick it back up again, you know, like it, it's, it, and then like, also it's, you know, you kind of want to space things out. Like if a couple songs have guitar solos, maybe you don't put those right next to each other. Maybe you put a guitar solo song next to a keyboard solo song next to a bass solo song sure. and kind of space things out that way. And it's, uh, it's kind of like yeah, a live good. set, like putting a live set. Yeah. Together. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, putting together an album sequence is kind of like that. It's like yeah. how, how would you want people to listen to your music just as like, how would you want people to, people to, how would you want people to experience your show? You know, like you, you want to like get them engaged right from the beginning and hold their attention, then maybe break it down a bit and then bring it back up. It's yeah. It's a similar thing. Yeah. It's funny. I had uh Mike Wanchik on the show. I don't know if he's uh John Cougars, John Mellencamp's guitar player for 40 years and his co-producer mm. on a lot of his records. And uh, cool. I know they put a lot of effort. I think that show drops actually tomorrow. But uh, cool. I asked him, I said, how do you guys prepare for your live show? Because I know he has worked really hard on that. And he goes, we take things, we look at things in sets of th three or four songs. And we, 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 we create these, you know, three to four song batches. And so we could plan. That's a, that's a planable thing, an arc for mm -hmm. us. And then we just do as many of those as we need to do. But yeah. 
I don't like before I started the show, I, I never thought about things like that. And now I, you know, I realized all the effort that goes into this kind of stuff. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a whole thing. You got yeah. the thought, thought into it. And I don't know if you, I don't remember if you got to this with Mindy A. Bear or not, but she put out a book called, um, I don't even remember if she talked about it on your show, but it's called How to Play Madison Square Garden. No, we didn't talk. We talked about and, it beforehand, but you know, you know, I have like some, I could be on the yeah, phone for six so hours. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But man, it's, it's, it's a great book. I really like agreed with everything she said. It's just like, how do you, it's, it's basically about putting, putting on a live show and it's, it's, um, has bits of it that are about stage performance and also about sequencing your live show, like putting your songs together and, and how to engage an audience and when to talk to an audience. And like, she compared it to a, to, to blowing up a balloon. It's like, you just keep putting air into it and it gets bigger. Eventually you let some air out and it shrinks and then you blow it up again. And it's, it is a really a cool uh, metaphor analogy. for that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I learned a lot from that book. It was, it was a really great book. I don't, I don't know if she's really, I mean, it came out probably good about five ten, years ago, yeah, maybe 10 years ago. ago. Yeah. Jeez, she's, time flies. It was a while ago, but, but great book. And it's just, it talks about that. Just putting together your live show in a way that's going to keep people engaged for the whole hour and a half or whatever it is. Yeah. But I want to make a note of that. The fact that you, this is what, I think a lot of people don't get, I think people sometimes feel things happen randomly. It's I've been working self-employed for 20 something years. Nothing happens randomly. You know, it might seem it. And sometimes the easier it seems, the harder you had to work to put it in place. But you know, here you are musician been professionally probably 30 plus years, right. Getting paid to do this. And uh, you read Mindy's book everything you know i mean it's like school's never out for the pro oh, i think the yeah. more you work the better you are in anything oh of course yeah and yeah. it's cool to just get other people's perspectives too that's what's so great about listening to your show is that Thanks. you have so many different musicians on there and, and everybody's path is a little different there's a lot of common threads mm -hmm. you know a lot of people do some of the things similarly but then others have a kind of a different method and, and it's cool like keep your mind open to that you know because none yeah. of us know everything, you know, and we yeah. can always change the way we're doing things and try different, different strategies out in, in whatever it is we're doing musically. It's yeah. uh, in anything. Yeah, never stop learning. Yeah. I agree, man. Roasted great guitar and the bass, your bass is cooking there. What's the backstory Thanks. of that song? That, that song kind of came out as sort of like a, that song has kind of a jam band vibe to it. Um, that was actually, kind of influenced by uh by some black crows tunes i was listening to you know the chorus of that goes into what we call the sweet home alabama part because it's like you know dcg you know <laughs> we, we're, we're, like what like when we're talking about when we're rehearsing it it's like okay when we get to the sweet home alabama part like, that, was, that wasn't my intention but it's those chord changes but it goes into that sort of southern rock vibe for the chorus um but then it has a couple other things too it has like it starts out with this little intro that comes in later where i'm just like playing 16th notes with a phaser which I love to, and I could do that all day long. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, phase yeah, ninety, that, what are you using? Uh, a phase ninety-five. It's it's that little skinny one. It's yeah. the MXR phase ninety-five, but it has yeah. like both the uh, classic script logo and the more modern phase ninety in one. So it's got like two different pedals in one. It's yeah. Great. Um, but yeah, that one just kind of came out of listening to some Black Crow stuff, and that's kind of the the most sort of jam bandy sort of song that I that I have on the record. I and love it. Josh just plays a ridiculous solo on it. Yeah. I mean, it just builds. And his whole concept for that solo section was Allman Brothers. He's like, I want to, like, because we were trying to, like, figure out how long the solo was going to be and all this stuff and you know, how many times through the... Major pentatonic? He, Is that what you mean by Allman Brothers? <laughs> well, well, there's definitely that. But, but I mean, just in, in how he builds, how he starts and where it, where it goes. And it's yeah. just like, I mean, he takes you on a journey on that one. And I just, that's one of my favorite solos of his on the record. Oh, it, Dickie Betts was great at that, so he picked mm, a good guy. For sure. um, yeah. But honestly, Josh is playing with it. I was, I was like, wow, I didn't. Because yeah, he's kind of like, tasty. yeah, he plays like he's my age, and I know he's not even close to my. Man, you know, he's, he's Josh is twenty nine now. Right. I started, I, I started so. playing with him when he was like, I don't know, twenty, twelve, twenty three, twenty four. <laughs> well, I mean, Josh, I mean, Josh was like playing arenas right out of high school. Like Josh, yeah, he's that. he's self taught, never went to college. He uh, like it, immediately after high school, he, well, I mean, he told you in the interview, he became um, the house guitarist for for uh, producer Johnny Sandlin down in, in uh, Muscle Shoals, and then after that, he got a gig with a huge a huge Japanese superstar and was like Bees. over was in he Japan. With Bees, the the lead singer of Bees, yeah, right, his name okay, was, uh, 
I'm blanking Koshi. on his name now, but um, Ko- Koshi Inaba, I think. Yeah, yeah, like Koshi Inaba. One, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. So like Josh is 17 years old and he's like playing Budokan, you know. Right. right. So and he's just, I mean, he's he's an old soul. Like he's yeah. just, you know, his playing just has so much depth to it and feel and taste and uh, yeah, he's great. Yeah. And the last time I want to talk about is the Trooper. You did an arrangement, a really good arrangement of Iron Maiden song. I was so happy you didn't play the Trooper. You know, you did your arrangement of the Trooper, sure. which was really yeah. cool. What made you do that track? Well, I'm, I've am i always been a huge Maiden fan. Like, ever since I started playing bass. Like, when I started getting more into bass and actually got some chops, I was, like, shedding Steve Harris. Like, Steve Harris and Getty oh, wow. Lee were, like, the guys when I was 16, you know? Yeah. So, like, I, I'm, I've always been a huge Maiden fan, but, like, I just don't really play that kind of music i don't get to do it that often yeah and i was just i was just trying to brainstorm covers for the album because i wanted to do a couple of covers yeah and i was just like thinking hmm like i wonder if a maiden tune would work in the context of like an instrumental quartet with hammond b3 playing the verse melody <laughs> and so i just kind of like was going through it. that was the first tune that came to mind i was because i was just kind of thinking you know a maiden song it wasn't the trooper at first i was like it's like how do I how do I do a maiden song like something kind of out of left field? I was like the trooper could be really cool, um, yes. and it, it turned out great. Like I didn't I didn't even make any sort of mock up or demo of that. I just like sent the guys like the, the song. I was like it's like here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you know Josh and Ty um, play that harmony thing in the intro. The you know um, you know that whole thing. Um, and then I'm thinking, okay, Ty, maybe on the B3, you play the verse. Like we, you know, we do the stop time thing and it turned out great. Like we started playing in the studio. We're like, this kind of works. Oh, it's great. It's one of my favorite we, songs on the record. Oh, thanks. And we put in some different stuff. Like we didn't do it just like the record. Like we, we do like a, you know, a little halftime thing where I'm playing with an octave pedal and we sort of break it down for the guitar solo and we changed the solo form a little bit. Um, so yeah. But it, it was it's so fun to play. I mean, it's so fun to do the uh, Steve Harris gallop, you know. Uh, it was great, a great arrangement. <laughs> I don't even like, Thanks. like, uh, and I mean this in a positive way, like to refer to you as a bass player because this is so much, I've, I've, I really enjoyed this so much more than like listening to you play bass. Not that I don't enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? It's, this is like, this is a great project that you've put together, cool. man. Yeah, Thanks. It's, it's really cool. Thanks. Um, what are your favorite songs on there? And also... I guess you answered. It's, I said, "Is funk what you tend to listen to?" Which you said it is a good part. Um, yeah. I mean, I've always been a been a huge fan of of funk, seventies funk, old school funk. Like that's you know, as a bass player, a lot of us gravitate towards that because the bass parts are so are so great. You know, I got turned on to a lot of that stuff um, back when I was seventeen. I was doing a cruise ship gig. I took I took a year off of school and I took a six month gig on a on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. And the drummer, the band leader. Um, actually used to play in Cameo and he was like super knowledgeable about all the 70s funk stuff and I was just coming out of jazz school and I hadn't been exposed to a lot of that stuff yet and he just turned me on to so much great stuff we would like on our port days we, we were we were in, in LA we were in San Pedro we, we would rent a car and drive up to Tower Records on our port days and I would just buy CDs and I'd be like okay what oh, should I buy now cool. and so he'd be like Earth, Wind and Fire he'd, he'd be like buy the James Brown box set buy you know Graham Central Station Sly and the Family Stone so he turned me on to that and I've just been hooked ever since. Um, so there's definitely a good deal of that on the record. Um, but like, you know, I, I, my tastes are eclectic. I, I like rock. I like, you know, I like jazz. I definitely went through, you know, a lot of years of, of being primarily a jazz player. Um, I love a lot of the riff rock stuff, uh, like government mule kind of stuff. Um, you know, so that, that made its way in, in into this record. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answered your question. No, I totally. It's about about funk, but as far as my favorite songs, yeah, what's the your record, favorite songs? I think my favorite one is probably "Get 'Em." I just love the way that turned out. Yeah, seventies cop show tune, and that was one where like I, I wrote the song and we tracked the basic tracks, you know, and, I, and then I sent it. I sent a rough mix of, of the basics to uh, Nathan the Horn Arranger, and he just nailed it. I just told him what I was going for. I was like, okay, I've been watching a lot of seventies TV. This, you know. This is that. I think I might have sent him like a playlist with some influences. I'm not sure if I did. Um, and I was like, okay, this section is going to be, we're thinking Love Boat on this section where it goes like, <laughs> the, like the disco bass thing where, where I'm playing like a, I'm playing a fuzz phaser melody. I was like, this is going to be like Love Boat here. And it's just, I mean, the horn parts he came up with, I, I first heard just like a MIDI mock-up that he did. And I was like, oh my God, I was blown away. So cool. um, that that's one of my favorites on the record. And then 
Um, I think the song One Man's Trash might be another favorite of mine, yeah. which is funny because that was that was one of my least favorite. Like when I was writing tunes and came up with a demo, I'm like, ah, oh, we'll try this, see if it works. But then once the guys put their stamp on it and we made it a band thing, I was like, you know what? This is, this is kind of one of my favorites on the record now. I, I, it's one of my favorites. Well. And you got a lot of long songs on here too, which I, I like. They're yeah. they're pretty long. I mean, I think that's typical when it's like an instrumental thing that includes, you know, with, you know, a heavy improvisational element, you know, with solos and stuff. So it ended up being a double album. Like when I did the vinyl, um, I couldn't fit it all into one record. So, that's it's, so it's, cool. a, it's a double Dude, album. You made a double record. It a double album. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, I, and you know what though? I know you keep saying it's a lot of instrumental and jam band. It, it doesn't, I, I just want to clarify for the listeners: this doesn't go off into jam band. It, no, it's not. It doesn't very have that, well. It doesn't have that like you know aimless you know it's in wa a wandering improvisate. Yeah, I mean yeah. all the sections are, are are delineated. The the parts are there. It's yeah. very parts oriented, but there are solos. Like it it does have you know it it'll get to a keyboard solo, get it to a guitar solo, uh, occasionally a bass solo. Even a couple drum solos, but yeah, I mean everything is arranged. It's not yeah. just like here's one chord and we're gonna jam on it for ten minutes. It's not. Yeah. It's not like that. But no. when I say jam band, I, I think I say that because I just think that this. When I think of the crowd of the audience for this record, I think I think it's gonna appeal to the jam band crowd, um, maybe more so than like the jazz or the fusion or the blues crowd, because they seem to embrace a lot of different styles of music. Like I've been yeah, subscribing to Re to Relics magazine, which used to be like a Grateful Dead magazine. Now it's yeah. just like, now it's like kind of a jam band magazine, but right. like the bands they report on and the musicians they report on are just like, it's so eclectic. And I see that like, that like that crowd, the crowd that is, that I say is the jam band crowd, they're into just so many different kinds of music. Um, and so I think that when I do get out there and, and play, play this stuff, I think it's going to be in front of the jam band crowds because I think they're going to appreciate it more. I think I think for the jazz crowd, it might not be jazz enough. For the blues crowd, it might not be blues enough. Um, but I think it's because of its eclectic nature and, and its organic nature, I just think that like it's going to appeal to that audience. Interesting. You know? I'll be interested. Uh, if you happen to think, I'll be interested to see what happens. You'll find out soon enough once you're out playing a little bit who's coming over to you after the show and what their vibe is yeah. and what they normally listen to. Yeah, That's always like... See. You know, and mar just like a marketing question, really is, and I love stuff like that. Like, you know, I'm I'm in a project, and I wonder, are these going to be new people in this career or middle? You know, it's always interesting mm -hmm. to see what that is, and it, sometimes you hit it, and sometimes you don't. But it's always fun to see where that is, and then you find mm -hmm. your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, okay, w w people to get the record, uh, three, uh, two places. Uh, first of all, Derek's got a bunch of videos coming out. The other good thing about Derek is if you get his music, it sits right under Derek and the Dominoes and right above Derek Trucks. So he's in good company. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. If yeah, I, I type know... my name in Spotify, immediately Derek Trucks comes comes up, which yeah. is cool. Yeah. I mean, that, he, he, I mean, he was actually an influence in this record, too. Like, I had a bunch of Derek Trucks band and Tedeschi Trucks band stuff in that playlist. Because, um, you know, some of the stuff that he was doing early on when he was really young and he had his own band, like... Some of that's a little fusiony, you know. They had horns, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, some is vocal, but some is instrumental and a little fusiony, you know. And, totally. Um, some of that stuff kind of seeped its way, you know, into this record because I'm, I'm a huge Derek Trucks fan. He's yeah. incredible. Tedeschi Trucks band is like, I mean, they're one of my all time favorites, you know. And to yeah. see them live is just, man, it's a religious experience. Yeah, I saw um, them live. It's pretty intense. No oh, man, so great, but. uh but yeah, but yeah, you'll you'll find if you type my name in Spotify, you you'll find me or the other Derek Frank that we were. Or the other Derek Frank. That's so the, funny. The, man. The, the, the Nashville Derek Frank. Yeah. This yeah, this is not the Nashville. Nothing against the Nashville Derek Frank, but this is yeah, the LA. Nothing against him. He's a great guy. But if you if you find a song on Spotify that's that's about a John Deere tractor, that's not mine. That's it's not this Derek Frank. Okay. So here's where you should hook up with Derek. First of all, on Instagram, uh Derek Frank Bass. He's got pretty much everything he's got going on is coming on there. He's got a bunch of videos coming out soon to promote a, a variety of songs on the record. You'll find them there. Also, uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel. It's just under Derek Frank, D-E-R-E-K Frank. Um, videos, go to DerekFrank.com and, and you can see all the videos there. But if you want to buy the music, which I would love everybody to support Derek's music, go to DerekFrank.com forward slash forward slash music. And uh, you can get all the cool stuff on there. His merch is on there. This is on there. His first album, which is called, uh, I wrote it down here. Let I'm the sorry. games begin. Yes, let the games be. You know what, man? This is what happens as you get old. I cannot read my writing anymore. I just look at it. Like, 
some scribble scrabble oh, let man. the games begin yeah um and uh anything else he's got coming on is going to be on there so go support Derek. um and anything else man uh i don't know we covered it this was great talking about the record this is the first time i've, I've had a chance to like really talk in depth about about the record usually when i do these things it's just kind of about career in general you know so yeah. this was fun this is fun cool, to talk man. about it you know it's a great it record was, as I said, it's, it's the one thing that kept me sane during the pandemic, or at least, uh, you know, 2020. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just cool to cool to talk about the process. And I hope that whoever, you know, listens to this podcast will go check it out. And I hope they dig it. Yeah, uh, please go check it out. Uh, and also, again, don't uh, don't shut off your wherever you're listening to this. I'm going to put Derek's original interview on there right behind this. So you can check it out. Dude, thank you so much for making this, man. I'm excited about it. And I want to yeah, look forward for having to having me. Your, yeah, of course, man. To your next record so cool uh, very cool yeah. check it out 11 years later buy this now everybody thanks so much for listening if you enjoyed this please share it on your social media channels we appreciate your support thanks very much Derek frank for coming on the show and for making this amazing record 11 years later and uh most important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice and uh make the best of whatever you got going on right now be nice go play your guitar or your bass and have fun yep till next time peace and love everybody i am out right on thank you so much brother cool thank you hey everybody this is craig garber welcome to everyone loves guitar in coronavirus world uh man we're going to give some love to the rhythm section today with an excellent bassist super experienced and really smart guy derek frank he's a touring and session bass player out of la couple of quick announcements. I want to thank our mutual friends, Joe Augello and Joshua Ray Gooch for connecting us. I had the pleasure of meeting Joe at NAMM. Uh, I have not met Josh in person yet. Also, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and uh, subscribe to the show. And if you're listening on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below on your right and click the bell. All righty, Derek Frank, originally from Pittsburgh, he started playing bass as a kid, practicing obsessively. Shortly after graduating from the music program at the University of Miami, he moved out to L.A. Since then, he's performed in 25 countries and 48 states on tours with a variety of artists and bands. He's currently the bass player for Gwen Stefani. He's been with Shania Twain playing bass with her for five years. He's also a member of the L.A.-based rock band, The Dirty Diamond. Hey, Fernando. Uh, and he's also part of the Soundcheck Live House Band at the Lucky Strike Live in Hollywood, which I think Joe's in that band too, no? Joe uh, subs quite a bit. Yeah. 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 He's one of our guests on a regular basis. And then he, he subs in the house band sometimes. That's a tough gig, isn't it? It's a lot of tunes. It's a lot of homework every time we do the gig, but it's, uh, it's a total blast. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I get, I would imagine that gives you a lot of visibility and actually credibility in the music market. Yeah, probably. I mean, we, it, it's usually packed. We get a lot of people out there. It's kind of like one of those gigs. That's kind of a scene. You know, yeah. we, we do it once a month. We get a lot of great special guests, a lot of kind of high profile people come and play with us sometimes. And yeah, it's fun. Coolest person you've, you've jammed with there. There. Um, hmm. We've had a lot of great people, probably Jackson Brown. Oh, wow. Yeah. Jackson came and did a set with us a while back. He was great. That's really cool. And uh, we've had, uh, we've had, um, let's see, uh, Nuno Betancourt comes down a bunch. Um, Orianti comes down sometimes. Uh, we've had a lot of really great people. That's, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Good opportunity for you. Yeah. Uh, Derek's also toured with Shakira, Air Supply. Did you play with um, Aaron? Yeah. Actually, I just listened to your your interview with Aaron the other night. Yeah. <laughs> he's, an, cool. he's a really nice guy. I got to hang with him here a little bit and when he was in Orlando. We went up there. Oh, um, cool. You went yeah. and saw the show? Yeah, really nice. And I felt so bad for him because cool. something happened. They had like a new a sound guy or like a sub sound guy and he uh, couldn't even hang out. He had to take care of sound. It was just, Oh stressful. wow. That he's a crazy. nice guy. Yeah, uh, sure. He's also sp uh, spent nine years from 2010 to 2018 with Mindy and bear and the bone shakers, Daniel powder, Victoria justice, Jeff Golub dancing with the stars for three seasons, and Brian augers oblivion express for like, almost close to 20 years as well as other people he's done one-off performances including tv shows with poe alan parsons greg raleigh band of course greg raleigh from santana he, right as he's an old yeah. keyboard. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah uh christina aguilera keb mo jennifer page and others and he's played bass on well over 40 albums as a session player he also has a solo record called let the games begin and he's working on another one to be released this year which we'll talk about 
after that. When he's not on tour, he teaches at MI and he splits his time between his homes in LA and Mammoth Lakes where he lives with his wife, Annette, and like a dog and a couple of cats. Is that good? <laughs> yep. We got a dog, Penny, two cats, Ringo and Sherwin. They're, everybody calls their cat Ringo. Every musician. <laughs> yeah, I guess it Most could be popular. one of those one of those typical uh, pet names, you know. No, it's good, man. It's wrong <laughs> uh, hey, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Uh, all right, so you grew up in Pittsburgh, I think, and then you moved to mm-hmm. Cleveland as a kid, and then you went to University of Miami. What prompted you to go yeah. down to school down there? Well. Um, they just had had a program that was really well suited to what I was doing. Um, it was a great jazz program, but very welcoming for um, uh, electric bass players. Um, I've never really been an upright player, even though I played jazz. I just never really got into upright. And every other college, their jazz program, you know, was pretty traditional, pretty rooted in big band stuff. Um, but Miami had a lot of electric jazz stuff going on, fusion and and a lot of pop stuff as well. So I, I'd pretty much narrowed it down to Miami and Berkeley. And uh, I went and visited Miami and I just liked it and it ended up being the only school I applied to. Very cool, man. So I've interviewed so many guys out of U of University of Miami. There's a lot of great, a yeah. lot of great players that, that have come out of Miami. A lot of them are out here in LA. Yeah. Anybody you went to school with that you wind up meeting or bumping into in LA? Oh, there's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of great musicians that I, that I play with and hang with. Um, Keyboard player Jeff Babco is out here. Sure. Uh, he, he plays in the Jimmy Kimmel saying. Band, among many other things. Uh, drummer Kevin Stevens, we play together a lot. Jason Sutter, Brandon Buckley, a lot of drummers. Um, guitar player named Andrew Sinewick. I don't know if you've had him on I the had show Andy, yet. I, yeah, he was on the show. Man, okay, did you yeah, hear his last incredible. record? Oh, so good. It's yeah. like a. My first thing I said is, how is it that the best funk record I've heard in 10 years is from a white dude from yeah, like yeah, Maryland yeah. or something like that? Right, right. <laughs> it's a great album, man. Absolutely. Yeah, he's just such a monster player. Man, yeah, he, yeah, he's played in my band quite a bit. Oh, well, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so after you graduated, you headed straight out to LA. Is that correct? I, I went to Boston for a short time. Um, I was there less than a year. I was there with a girl, didn't work out, didn't really get plugged into the scene all that well up there. So yeah, after about a year, I, I bailed. Yeah, I moved yeah. to LA. What, um, once you, what prompted you to do that and how'd you get work once you got out there? Well, I, I moved to LA kind of by mistake. I, it, it, was, it was a thing where I, I, I was leaving Boston and I had a lot of friends in San Francisco that were, that were playing jazz and, and making it work, you know, making a living at it. And that's kind of where my head was at at the time. So I was like, I, I'm going to go to San Francisco. But my parents had moved to LA while I was in college at Miami. And I just never really checked out LA for some reason. Um, I'd only been to LA on, you know, like, you know, breaks from school. Um, but they were living in LA and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go just kind of reset live with my parents for, for the summer, maybe get a day job, save some money. Cause yeah. I was just, I was broke at the time. And I was like, I'll just go live with my parents for a bit. And then, uh, and then move to San Fran. But it was like, after I was in town for like a week, I was, I, I was sold on LA. Like I had friends from college that were out here. They were already gigging. They kind of threw me gigs right away. And you know, I was gigging within, you know, a couple of weeks of being in town. So I was like, you know what, there's no reason for me to be anywhere but here. That's and I just grew, I grew to love LA. You know, I've been here, I've been here 23 years now. What, um, what made your folks go out there? A uh, job. My dad, uh, my dad took a job in, in, uh, in LA. He worked for, um, uh, Southern California Edison, the power company. Oh, cool. They, they were in Florida before that. He was with Florida power and light. FP and L right FPL. on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 When you, uh, once you got out there, was there any like cultural adjustments you had to make? Not really. I, I loved it. It, it kind of felt like home right away. You know, like some cities you can go to and they just, uh, you know, you feel kind of weird. You feel maybe out of place. It doesn't feel that comfortable. You don't feel like you belong there. LA was one of those places that I just, I felt like I embraced it right away and it embraced me. I just, I, I loved it. You know, it's just, I mean, it's great. the entertainment capital of the world. You know, it's, everything's going on here and just, just the, the music scene is so great. And I fell in love with it immediately. And I guess even though you grew up in the Midwest, Miami probably set you, you could go anywhere after you live in Yeah, Miami. Miami, going to Miami from, uh, from Cleveland was kind of, that was the culture shock. What was you know, it? I, <laughs> was- I just, I, I, you know, I grew up in the suburbs, you know, suburbs of Pittsburgh and in Cleveland and small towns in Connecticut. 
and I went to Miami, which is this major, you know, multicultural city. Um, it was just a different world, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I didn't really like Miami. I didn't, uh, I didn't find it to be that friendly of a city. It's I didn't South like the Florida weather. in general is not friendly. I lived in plantation yeah. for like 15 years. It is really not friendly at all. Yeah. It's kind of weird. I mean, I came from the Midwest where, you know, it's, people are friendly. People are friendly to each other. It's just yeah. kind of the vibe. Miami, I just, I don't know. I felt to be very it's cold. Aggressive. Not, it's you know, really aggressive. aggressive. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So that was kind of a culture shock when I first moved there. Um, mm-hmm. I eventually, you know, got used to it. Of course I did my four years, you know, in college, but I couldn't wait to get out of there. It was, it yeah. was just, it wasn't my home, you know? Yeah. I get that. When we moved yeah. to Tampa, it was a big change for the better for us to, and I grew up in New York city, but I found South Florida oh, just man. incredibly aggressive, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Is, uh, weird. It's interesting. All right. So I'm going to talk about some of the artists you've played with. If you could tell me how you got the gig and if there's any cool or interesting stories about working with them. Uh, Mindy cool. Bear, you, you were with mm-hmm. her a really long time. Yeah. From like 2010 to 2018. Yeah. That's a long time. Well, how did you get that yeah. gig? Uh, I had a couple of friends in her band, uh, guitarist Jay Gore and drummer Jamie Tate. They, they were already in her band for a while and uh, it came time for her to find a, find a bass player. So they threw my name in the hat. It was interesting. She actually scouted me. I didn't realize it, but she told me later, like I was gigging with my own band at the time. And she came to one of my gigs at the Mint, this club in LA. And, uh, and I didn't even know she was there and she was checking me out, you know, and um, awesome. she told me later, she's like, Oh yeah, I came to see you. I was like, you didn't even say hello. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so um, yeah, she had a little audition and uh, she ended up picking me and yeah, had a lot of fun with that band. She's awesome. Great musician, great person. Um, always had great people in the band. You know, we had, you know, a little bit of turnover, some, some players changing over the years, but uh, man, so fun, you know, it's so, so, so much fun musically. That's great. I, and if you're comfortable and, if, and I'm not looking for gossip, what happened? Like, how come you, you were there a long time? What happened? Was it just time? Yeah, it's um, it, it got to the point where I just, I, my schedule was just getting too crazy. Uh, I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. And it just made sense for the guy who was subbing with me to subbing for me to become the main guy. I, um, she was always really cool with me. Like, like whenever I would get, you know, kind of more high profile, um, tours or whatever, she was always cool with me subbing out. I would call her and be like, ah, I just got called for the summer tour. It's a good opportunity, you know? And she was always so cool. She's like, go do the tour, come back, you know, we'll keep your seat warm for you. You know, um, she was always really great about that. And then it got to a point where I was just things were kind of picking up in my career and I was kind of getting called for one thing after another. And, and they were just opportunities that I, that I couldn't pass up. Good. Um, you know, Shania, air supply, uh, Gwen. Um, and it just, it just got to the point where I just, I wasn't there. I wasn't on the, on the Mindy gigs anymore. And, uh, Ben White, the guy who was subbing for me, he was just there way more than me. And it just, we talked about it and I was like, yeah, it just makes sense. You know, good. and I'll, I'll be here to sub if you need me to sub. You know. That's good. Hey, man, so that's a nice problem to have, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're still in great terms. I got to talk to her every now and then. And yeah. Very cool, man. Yeah. How, how did you get the gig with Shania? And we were talking, I've, I've had a bunch of those guys on here at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that come about? So, um, Joshua Ray Gucci, you've, you've had on the show. Um, we knew each other just through kind of like jam sessions in town and stuff. I used to host a jam at a club called Cafe Cordial, and Josh would come down and sit in. And we, we kind of knew each other a little bit from that. Um, was that my email or yours? If it's mine, I'm going to, I'm going to quit. No, not um, mine. That was mine. Yeah. Let me quit. Oh, good. Yeah. Man. I didn't I even hear it. So that, I don't want to have that dinging in the background. Um, but anyway, yeah. So Joshua Rigooch, um, he, he was doing a, uh, kind of a weekly blues gig at this hotel bar in Beverly Hills. And, uh, he called me for it and it was just like, he called me that day. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll scramble and learn all these tunes and come down. And I went down and played. We just had a great time playing together. It just, just kind of we gelled really well and had a great time hanging. And and uh, I was just saying, you know, hey, how's the Shania gig? Because he'd been on it for a while. She had just finished her uh, her Vegas residency at Caesars. And uh, and he's like, yeah, it's a great gig, total blast. Um, you know, she might be changing up the band. Like, would you be interested if she was looking for a bass player? And of course, I was like, yeah. So um, no, Josh I don't want a up, permanent gig at the. No, I don't want to play with a country <laughs> pop superstar. I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, no way. <laughs> yeah. So um, he threw my name in the hat to Corey, who you've also had on the show, Corey yeah. Cherko, who was who's uh, her band leader. Uh, right. Musical director. He's a super talented dude, man. Yeah. Oh, amazing. They're both just incredible. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, so he threw my name in the hat to Corey. Corey had me send had me send in just like some video links and 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 things like that. Um, so I sent that to Corey, and it turns out um, the musical director who was actually putting putting the whole show together, overseeing the whole thing, was Will Hollis, who was the MD on the Dancing with the Stars tours that I had done years before. Oh. So so Will was like, oh yeah, no Derek, yeah, we've I've had him on some tours. So I kind of had two people in my corner throwing my name in the hat. So that helped. Um, so then she was just for that tour, she was just auditioning bass and drums. And so she narrowed it down to four bass players and six drummers. And we all went down to an audition. This is like, this is like a month after Josh threw my name in the hat. Um, it was a great audition. It was like an all day thing. They, they mixed and matched us. They had every bass player play with every drummer just to see who, who gelled and, and who was the right vibe. Um, so I did the audition and uh, yeah, ended up getting offered the gig. That's nice. You know what? That's like, um, that brings up a really important point. So you had this gig in 07, 08, and 09 with Dancing with the Stars. Mm -hmm. And that connection there later was a support for you shortly afterwards when he's, hey, man, that guy's a good, yeah. good dude. And I, it, this business is so like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you really yeah. need to treat everybody good on all the gigs, man. Absolutely. Because if you work with somebody on one gig and that ends – you never know. Years later, they might be doing something else and say, oh, yeah, you know, get him. You know, it might not happen right away. Like, like you know, I worked with Will, yeah, 2007 to 2009 and then didn't work with him again until 2015. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like that sometimes, you know. Uh, any funny stories or interesting or cool stories? Uh, I forgot to ask you, Mindy and Shania. Uh, they're just, they're, they're all there's, there's so many funny stories, you know, it's like when you're on the road, you just, you run into so many crazy people, you know, usually in the audience, you know, just people in general are maniacs. So I think just, um, you know, uh, and then you just have a lot of laughs, just like riding around in buses and vans with people. It's just a lot of joking around. And, you know, the cool thing is we, we musicians, um, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of allowed and also expected to act like children a lot of times. Sure. You know, yeah. so uh, there's just a lot of goofing off and a lot of funny stuff. I, I can't think of any one instance from those sure. gigs, but there are just so many. You know, we just had a lot of laughs. I mean, a lot of good times. Man, I tell you, if Joshua, uh, young guy, uh, he's a guy who acts way older than he is. You know, he's a super he's an positive. Old soul. Yeah, but yeah. he's a super positive person. You know, and I really I remember mm -hmm. that about him. It was very mm -hmm. nice to connect with him on that. Yeah, for sure. Brian Auger. So for people who don't know Brian, why don't you talk about who Brian is and you've been with him forever. Yeah. I, uh, well, Brian Auger, first of all, he's a, he's a Hammond B3 legend, basically. Um, had a band in this, in the late sixties, uh, out of the UK called Brian Auger Trinity with a singer named Julie Driscoll that turned into Brian Auger's Oblivion Express, which was kind of like a fusion acid jazz band, uh, you know, led by Brian, uh, playing b3 organ and he's just a complete monster i mean he is so good uh, um and I, I was aware of him early on uh I, I had a friend my buddy dan lots was playing bass with him um and there was a tour that dan couldn't do in 2002 so he recommended me to brian brian gave me a call we went and jammed uh it all it all worked out and he said hey let's go on the road so uh that was 2002 like early 2002 and I was with him pretty much full time up till about 2010. And then I filled in here and there. I, I subbed for a little bit. The, the bass chair with his band was kind of like kind of rotating based on people's availability. So for a while, there were like three of us that were kind of rotating in and out. Um, but uh, yeah, I was with him full time for a while and then just kind of on a rotating basis for a bit. And um, yeah. Yeah, I just talked to his son yesterday. Actually, Karma is the is the drummer and kind of kind of runs the whole ship. And um, yeah, is he still he touring. I mean, not, nobody's touring now, but is he still out there doing it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He still takes the Oblivion Express out. Um, he also he also plays with a really big uh, Italian artist named Zucchero. Oh um, yeah, yeah. I've had his uh, uh, Cat Dyson. I think plays with. Oh him. cool. Oh really? Okay, cool. Zuc uh, yeah, somebody. I've had a couple of his guitar players on. There. Oh cool. Yeah. Yeah, so Brian's been been playing with him for years, and apparently he had a, a huge tour this year that is that completely got canceled. Um, so I'm not sure when Brian's going to go back out with his own band, but 
yeah, I mean, he's, he still plays all over the world, you know, a lot of, spends a lot of time in Europe. And when I was touring with him, we, we were in Europe a few times a year. That's nice, man. Yeah. Very cool. He's, he's great. And it's just playing with him was just such a joy. I mean, I mean, he's just going for it constantly and means every note he plays. Like the minute he puts his hands on the B3, like his just facial expression changes. Like when his fingers hit those keys, it's just like, ah, he just turns into this monster and he's just ripping. Yeah. And I always just love that. In your experience, do you think some of that is maybe because he's an older guy and like, you know, when you get older, you kind of like, fuck it. You don't have, you have less inhibitions or yeah. has he always been like that? He's probably always been like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think that's kind of who he is as a musician, you know, that's great. And I just love it. You know, you, you just tell he means everything he plays, you know, it's awesome. Um, any, any other gigs that you've done that you want to talk about that were cool or just interesting or memorable? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all, they're all fun. They're all cool. They're memorable. You know, I've been really lucky to have been able to play with a lot of great people. You know, Brian was the first guy I toured with. Um, so that was like my first experience on the road. Um, from him, I went on to uh, kind of get into some pop stuff. Um, I worked with, a, with a, a, an act named Ali and AJ. They were like a Disney act on Hollywood Records and did, did a couple tours with them. That was kind of my uh, initiation into the pop world. Uh, they were great. They're, they're still out there touring as well. Um, and of course, you know, Shania, Gwen, you know, love playing with both of them. Mindy was great. We talked about that. Um, yeah, and I've had, a, you know, some opportunities to fill in with some people here and there, but it's, it's been good. I, I've been really lucky to have been able to work with some really good artists over the years. I, you know, I, I hear a lot of nightmare stories about people just working with horrible artists, you know, major divas, stuff like that. I, I haven't had those experiences. Everything I feel like every tour I've been on has been positive, you know, and I, That's great. you know, I've never really had any negative things to say about people I've been on the road with. You're good with one of the things, like I, I watch videos of you. You're good with, you're like fully aware that you're in the entertainment business just mm -hmm. by, no, but I mean, doing stuff like how you dress, you, you're, you dressed really cool, like to entertain. Mm -hmm. You know, is Thank that, you. yeah, man. I mean, and I, I noticed that I'm sure I'm not the only one noticed. I'm sure your, hmm. your artists noticed that, but I mean, when you're putting effort into stuff like that, you know, you're not showing up in jeans and a t-shirt, which is nothing right. wrong with it. But right. you know, right. I think when you're in this, especially these big gigs, you're an entertainer, man. And yeah. You yeah. Look you, good you, up there. you, you, you got to dress the part, you know, like images is a big part of it. Like, you can't be playing with Gwen Stefani and wearing a polo <laughs> shirt and Dockers, you know? And, and, and I like it. Like I, I honestly, I honestly love playing dress, playing, playing dress up, you know, you know I'm into what? You it. Look I'm, totally, I'm into clothes. Yeah, I, you, you know, look, yeah. You can what, see one, that. one thing that's really fun for me is like what, when these tours are, are being put together, um, you, you, you talk about wardrobe, you know, that's part of it. It's like, yeah. okay, well, what's, what's the look going to be? And, and a lot of these artists will have stylists and you work with the stylist and, you know, you, you, you work together to figure out what your stage outfit's going to be. And I, I love oh, that. That's part. cool, man. And a lot of times these, these stylists will like just bring racks of clothes for you. you. You email them all your sizes and stuff and they just bring a bunch of stuff. And I'm just, I'm pretty particular about what I wear. I just, I like clothes. I like fashion. Right. Um, so well, you could tell, like, man, you're like well put together on stage. You could tell like, you know, you, cool. this is a guy that took his time and effort and would deliver deliberately to look good, man. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I like picking out my own stuff. I mean, a lot of times, like, like when those stylists bring the racks of clothes, I'd be like, ah, it's okay. But I'm like, I'll start looking online to find some stuff ahead of time. Like, what about this? What about this? And it's kind of cool. And when, when an artist will give you a little bit of freedom and they don't just like give you like a costume, because a lot of artists do that, <laughs> like, you know, they're just like, this is your costume. It's cool when they can give you a general vibe and be like, yeah. this is kind of the general vibe. This is the color scheme. And then you can pick stuff out like with, with the Gwen thing. Um, I just had this idea of wearing like a white tuxedo jacket, you know, with like some skinny jeans and stuff. I found when I showed it to Gwen, she's like, yeah, that's cool. Get that. You know? Um, so it's, it's kind of cool when you get, when you get to do that, you know? That is cool. I mean, you even don't do up your hair different ways, which is like really, I don't have that luxury of course, but I mean, you know, I, I recognize when other people do the effort. It's pretty cool, man. Oh, cool. Hey, it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. man. Well, you could tell you're having fun up there. That's what's nice sure. about it. You know, sure. it's not like yeah. you're up there like, God, get me the fuck out of these clothes. You know, you could tell you like enjoying what you're doing and the whole no, I, I, I like it. And not, not everybody does. Like some people are just like, ah, I just want to wear, you know, I want to wear my jeans and t-shirt. Well, I got to wear this funny outfit. But like, 
I, I don't know. I'm just into it. I, I remember once getting called for a, a tour, uh, the, the, the director, the creative director called me and he's like, he's like, Hey man, we're having a, we're having a problem with this bass player. Like, would you like, would you potentially be able to do this tour? And I was like, what's going on? It's like, uh, the guy, you know, like, the guy won't wear the freaking wardrobe. <laughs> like apparently like they had the band like in suits or something. And he's like, I'm not wearing a suit, you know? Like, and so the creative director is like, dude, like, all right, well, I'm going to start calling some other bass players. Like it's not going to wear the clothes. I was like, yeah, I'll put the suit on. Come on. Love Absolutely. wearing suits. That's cool. <laughs> and the, the guy ended up saying, okay, I'll wear the suit. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It's, I had uh, like, I had Steve Stevens on the show and he's like totally macked out on stage. And he was mm -hmm. just like, in you know not obvious for the interview he was just in casual clothes and i said you know you're always super stylish and he goes look he goes you think i can get on stage with billy idol in sweatpants you're kidding yourself oh of course <laughs> you know course. that's the yeah. whole vibe up there man you gotta yeah. be who you you know you gotta be stylish up there for that kind yeah, of a gig yeah yeah there's there's an, there's an expectation there you know yeah well you do it well man so congrats uh, thank to you. you thank you uh what was growing up in pittsburgh and cleveland like what was your childhood like it's great. I, I had a great, um, great childhood, great family life and, uh, you know, just great suburban upbringing. You know, it's like, um, I was born in Pittsburgh. We lived in one suburb and we moved to Baltimore for a short bit and moved back to Pittsburgh for a few years in a different suburb. Um, so I, I, I totally had that just like suburban childhood, you know, um, Good for you, man. where, where, you know, there, there's a big city nearby that we could go to, to access the things that big cities offer, you know, like, concerts and you know things like that good restaurants and stuff like that you know but but we lived out out in the suburbs and it was just kind of uh yeah it was great i had, had a great childhood you know went, very went, cool you know rode rode bmx bikes with all my friends in the neighborhood and had woods to go play in and all that stuff you know right on yeah man. yeah and pittsburgh is like a um a tech and banking hub now isn't it it's interesting it's changed a lot i mean you know yeah. it, it's it's known as like you know a rust belt city and my dad did work for the steel company he he worked for u.s steel which is you know the big industry or yeah. was the big industry in pittsburgh for years um man we we uh i mean i, I our family family left there when i was 10 so it kind of didn't really have any any ties moving moving on but um my wife and i went there a couple years back for a, a vacation basically um went for like a week she wanted to see where i grew up and we, we were actually going to see uh you too. We wanted to see the Joshua tree tour and I was oh, busy wow. that year and I couldn't see them in LA. So we're like, all right, where are they playing where it's a break in my schedule? We're like Pittsburgh. Great. You can see where I grew up. We'll go see you too. Um, and, uh, that, that whole trip turned into us seeing you too, uh, Tom Petty, like two months before he passed and game five of the Stanley cup finals. Pittsburgh oh my God. Nashville. That's a pretty it was, cool. It was like this epic Pittsburgh <laughs> thing, but like in going back there, I hadn't really experienced Pittsburgh as an adult. Mm. Um, aside from like a couple of tour stops or just kind of, you know, in and out. Um, it's a great city, you know, it's really come up. That's cool, man. A lot of yeah. great restaurants and like kind of hipster neighborhoods now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool city. That's very cool, man. Sounds like yeah. a great vacation. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything you're looking to do more of over the next, like assuming life gets back to normal for all of us soon, yeah. sooner than later, hopefully. Uh, mm. any, what things are like, what short, I, I hate to say what are your short term and long term goals, but what what things do you have have planned or you know? Well, um, I'm I'm still in Gwen Stefani's band and Shania Twain's band, and we're we're in the midst of, of a Vegas residency for both artists in the same venue, both at the uh, Zappos Theater and uh, Planet Hollywood. So we have a lot of dates on the books for that. Um, Gwen's last run in Vegas was supposed to be in May, and then obviously got canceled. So, that, so that's going to be rescheduled. So we'll, we'll have one more run in Vegas with Gwen at some point. Um, hasn't been announced yet. We just got to see how this, how this all plays out. Um, and then Shania's booked through 2021. We canceled a bunch of dates as well that will be rescheduled. So, um, you know, who knows that might go till 2022 now just because of this, because of the cancellations. Um, so yeah, just, I, I've, I've got more stuff with them potentially coming up when we can get back to live shows. Yeah. Uh, so I've got that to look forward to. We, we actually have a, a, a European festival run with Gwen in July. Oh, great. As of now, it's still on the books and we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that's still there. Um, we'll, we'll see. We all just gotta kind of be open to change at this point, but, uh, yeah. So European festival tour with Gwen, um, you know, another Vegas run with Shania in August and beyond. And, uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'm just writing and, 
uh, planning, planning my next solo record, which I'm hoping to, to record at the end of June. I've been, um, talking to Jim Scott, uh, producer, um, and he's Joe Satriani's be, producer, as you just, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. Tedeschi trucks band and, and so many other people. Um, he's got a great studio in Valencia called pliers. Um, I've done some session work there and it's just, just a complete playground of vintage gear. So I was talking to Jim <laughs> about recording the record there. So, um, I'm going to do that. And then I just look forward to, uh, you know, once the record's done, start gigging with my own band again, because it's something I was doing for a couple years and, and kind of mellowed out on that. Uh, so I look forward to getting back to that. Is that a trio or a four or what? As of now, I'm planning it as a four piece, um, keys, guitar, bass, drums. Um, I've had ideas of maybe expanding it to a five piece with either two keyboard, two keyboardists or two guitarists. I just got to see how it all plays out. Like I'm just kind of writing sketches right now, just kind of basic sketches. And then um, once I get guys into play, it will kind of see what, what the music needs. That's so cool. Do you have like yeah. people in mind for these slots? If you, if you can yeah. share. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've talked to Joshua, uh, Joshua Ray Gooch again yeah. about playing guitar on it. Um, uh, Ty Bailey is, is going to play keys. He's Katy Perry's keyboard player. Um, and we, we do some gigs around town with this, um, soul band, which is really fun. And Ty's a big B3 guy. Okay. Um, and, and that's keyboard wise, that's mainly what it's going to be on the record. A lot of B3 and clav. Um, and you like obviously the soul groove stuff then. Cause you, you yeah. know, like even the, vo your excitement about even when you're talking about Brian Auger, the B3 seems to really, mm -hmm. you know, vibe well with you. Yeah. That, that's the kind of stuff I, I really dig. Like I've been a big fan of John Schofield's for a long time. Like his, his John Schofield band, you know, the Uber jam stuff um, is his stuff that he's done with Nesky Martin and Wood. I sure. just love the vibe of that stuff. So I'm trying to figure out a way to, to do something similar to that, but, but that will feature the bass a little bit more. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's kind of, kind of the vibe that I'm going for. Very cool. I'll look forward to uh, hearing your record. Hopefully you come cool. on the show and preview cool. it. Yeah. Cool. Derek, what were some of the low points? or darker periods you had to deal with. And yeah. You, get them. Um, you know, but my, my real lowest point or kind of darkest point came at kind of a high point in my career. Uh, uh, unfortunately I was, I was on a tour in China with a, an artist named Daniel powder back in April, uh, two years ago. And, uh, first day of the tour, I got a call that my mom passed away. Um, oh my God. And I was, so in, I was in China. It was like the, oh. the first, the first day, uh, I, you know, oh. we were, we were about, we were about to start a production rehearsal and got the call and, uh, I'm in the middle of nowhere, an hour outside of Beijing at about to start the three week tour. And it was, uh, yeah, obviously that's a, it's a rough thing. And at the, at the time I was, I, I was kind of in shock. I was like, okay, do I, do I go home? Do I bail on the tour? You know, these guys are counting on me. Uh, it, it, you know, it happened suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, I was like, there's nothing I can, I can do at home, but do I go home just to be home, be with my family or do I stay here? Do I at least go back to the hotel and just shine this rehearsal or do I rehearse? It was like one of those things where just like, I just, I had no idea what to do when I got the call. No so frame of reference for anything. Like yeah. That. I mean, it's I was, problem. I was talking to my sister and she was like, she was saying, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing you can do you know, if you want to continue the tour, you know, and, and for me being, you know, a musician, that's like where I find comfort in playing. Yeah. And so, uh, I just, I decided to continue the tour. Luckily I was with a great group of people, great artists. He immediately, like we were all just hanging outside waiting for the crew to get set up. Well, when I got the call and Daniel was just like, whatever you need, if you need to go home, cool. If you need me to fly your wife out, cool. Like, you know, that's really, he, he was, he was, he was great, great, great yeah. artist, great guy, great band. Um, so I, I, uh, you know, I continued the tour. It, it was rough. I was just obviously in a, just, you know, totally weird headspace for the whole, the whole tour. Was just, I kind of couldn't wait to get home. I was, I was happy to be on tour with people. I, you know, with good people, you know, that kind of kept me, kept my spirits up. I was happy to get the comfort from playing. Cause that's, you know, where I'm at my happiest is when I'm playing my instrument in front of people. And so I got to do that. But at the same time, I was just like, I can't wait to get home and just, shut down for a bit but of course uh I, I didn't get the opportunity to do that 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 for quite a while i two days after i got that news i got a call to join gwen stefani's band and it was like right when that tour ended i was like they were i was gonna have to miss some rehearsals and i was like well i'm, I'm back on this date i can be back i can be in rehearsal the next morning 
So I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to get time to just be home and grieve. I'm going to go right back into work when I get home. But it's like, how do you say no to Gwen Stefani? You know? No, you can't. So I got called for that. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to get a chance to shut down for a while. I'm going to go right into Gwen rehearsals. So I went into Gwen rehearsals for a month. And then we had a Vegas, we had a Vegas, we had a Vegas run, uh, you know, after that was the Vegas residency. And then, uh, I was like, okay, well after that first Vegas run, then I'm, I, I rented a, I rented a place in Colorado for a month and I was just like, I'm going to get away and just shut down process everything. Um, but then of course I got called to, to go sub with Shakira for a little bit. So I was like, okay, I can't say no to Shakira. So I'm going to go do that. Then I got a call to do some Shania stuff. She had a big festival in Brazil, which would require me to do another show in the States as like a warm up. It's like, okay, got to do the Shania show in Brazil. Then I can shut down. So it's like, you know, this happened. I got the news in, in April and wasn't able to really like just stop until like mid August. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That had to be rough. So it was rough. Cause it was like, it was kind of a high point in my career. You know, it was like I had all these great artists that yeah. I was getting the opportunity to play with. But really, I just like wanted to just <laughs> stop and and just shut down and and process everything and and grieve, you know. Um, so it, yeah, it was interesting. It's, it's tough, like it, it's like it, you know, in a way, it's like that's comforting getting to play all all that much. And I've you know that brings me happiness. But I've got you know this on this side. Yeah, well, you had this thing hanging over you. So yeah. it's not like so, you know you're looking forward to like oh we're buying a new house. You know this is yeah. It, 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 it was it was stressful. It was it, yeah, it, it was a lot. Stressful. You know, yeah, yeah. So that was you know it was kind of the roughest period I think I've gone through so far. You know, man, you know, I'm really sorry I, for your loss. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was tough. And, and like I said, the good thing is I was surrounding myself with some really great people that were very supportive. And, you know, uh, you know, Daniel Powder was great. Um, you know, great to just offer to do whatever, whatever I needed, you know? Yeah, that was really kind. How's your dad doing? Uh, he's cool. They, they, uh, they, they, they weren't together. Oh, okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. They, they divorced yeah. and yeah, a while, while back. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was a tough thing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, man. Yeah. Glad oh, you thanks. That. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, talk about maybe some mistakes if you're comfortable, like one or two mistakes you might've made along the journey and the lessons that you learned from them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, for every gig I do or every audition, like I, I'm always just trying to improve what I, whatever I'm doing. So I'll, after I do something, you know, I'll, I'll look back and say, okay, how could I have done that better? Um, and a lot of times that's, that's, you know, when I was auditioning for, for gigs and if, if I, if I didn't get the gig, I'd be like, okay, well, why didn't I get the gig? What can I do better next time? Um, so I was kind of doing that. The, the one kind of, one kind of mistake I made that, that I look back on, um, I remember years ago I was, uh, I just finished a tour, uh, with, with this artist and, um, one of the artists that had opened for us a couple times, uh, was auditioning and, and I was on a little bit little bit of a break and I got called to audition for this artist. Uh, but she wasn't that big at the time. And I was kind of like, it was, I kind of looked at it as a step down. I'm like, yeah, I was like, I'll go audition. Just, you know, I can meet some people, whatever, be good to audition, but I, you know, whatever, this is kind of below what I'm already doing. And eh. so I, it was one of those things where I didn't really bring my a game. And I'm one of those guys that always loves to, you know, I always go above and beyond as much as I can. I always like to bring my a game no matter what it is. And this is one instance where I just really didn't. I just kind of half-assed it. I didn't really learn all the tunes. I just kind of showed up and I was like, yeah, it'd just be cool to meet some people, but I, you know, I don't really want this gig. So I auditioned. Um, of course, I didn't get the gig. And then of course, the artist went on to be huge. <laughs> and and, and the, the guitarist that I had just um, gotten off tour with, he auditioned as well, got the gig and he's still on it. And this goes back to 2000 six or seven probably 2007 oh my is god when this happened like and this guitarist is still on that years. gig yeah and that guitarist is still on the gig holy yeah, shit yeah. yeah so that was one thing where i look back i'm like you know what should have brought my a game i mean who knows maybe i wouldn't that doesn't mean i would have gotten the gig but at least i could have looked back and said you know what i did my best yeah like, you do you know, that I, for you not for the other person of course yeah, yeah and yeah. and you know i i've auditioned for tons of stuff over the years and a lot of gigs i didn't get and uh and i can look back and say well at least i did the best i could you know yeah i totally yeah. get it yeah man yeah 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 you know it's funny that is a uh a common answer to that question mm. 
where people have, you know, I went on this gig, I didn't bring my A game. That's a, not an uncommon mm-hmm. answer to that question at all. Yeah. And as yeah. we get older, obviously through experience, we can look back on that stuff, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and we can say like, okay, yeah, like I, I won't do that again. Like now I know that if I say I'm going to show up for something, even if it's an audition or whatever, I'm going to bring my A game, you know? Yeah. I mean, my, my philosophy has always been like, make them want me and then I can decide if I want the gig, you know? Absolutely. But it's like, I feel like if I didn't want the gig anyway, I just, I shouldn't show up to the audition. You know? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, musically, anybody who, who influenced your playing that people, anybody that influenced your playing that people might be surprised to hear? I think my biggest influences are people that, you know, uh, a lot of bass players influ- influenced by like, you know, Paul McCartney, uh, you know, John Paul Jones, James Jamerson, Pino Palladino, Marcus Miller, Rocco Prestia, Jaco Pistorius, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, people that people might be surprised by would be um, some players that aren't actually bass players. Like I, I love uh, synth bass players, uh, wow. guys that, you know, play, play great bass lines on synth. Um, Greg Fillingaines played a lot of the uh, Michael Jackson stuff. Um, Stevie Wonder played a lot of synth bass on his stuff. Prince did some synth bass on his stuff. Like I, I, I'm heavily influenced by those guys and what they did on synth bass. Um, and I, I do play synth bass as well. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I love that stuff. So people might be surprised that like some of my biggest influences aren't even bass players per se. Uh, yeah. Man, you got a hell of a, lot, a massive bass collection for a, a Bass players don't usually have that many basses. They're, they're, you're like bordering it, on guitar acquisitions. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of getting a little out of control. And this isn't even a complete collection. This is just what I've got at home. I've got I've got a bunch in in storage with Shania that I use on that gig. I got a bunch in storage with Gwen that I use on that gig, and a couple others in my own storage. You know, that's great. Don't really man. play much anymore. It's it's a it's a sickness. Very cool. <laughs> hey, man, you're a professional. You need that equipment. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, keep telling people that. You do. Uh, yeah. Favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with? Uh, there's so many. I mean, like like I was saying before, I've been lucky that I've played with a lot of really great people. Like, I haven't played with any nightmare artists. I haven't played with, you know, many musicians that I, that I didn't think were great. Um, you know, obviously, Brian Auger was great. Like, he was, like I said before, he's the first guy I toured with. And, you know, it was real, real inspiring to play with him and just see how he just goes for it every night. Uh, Mindy was great as well. She's just great at what she does, you know, and a great person. Um, really enjoyed playing with her and, and her band. Uh, you know, the Mindy Bear band, also the Bone Shakers with Randy Jacobs. And, um, we, we had a, we had a great thing going with that band. Uh, you know, I, I love playing with Shania's band. Me and Corey and Josh, you know, get along so well. And those guys are such great players. Like, I mean, they're just monster guitar players yeah. and they're both so different from each other. You know, yeah. it's, yeah. that's what's so great. And they, they work so well together. Just like a lot of the, a lot of the solos that are like sort of trading. A lot, a lot of the solos in the Shania show are like, it's like starts with half Corey and then, and it goes to half Josh, you know, and they're so great at, at like just playing off of each other and coming up with some little like harmony things as well. Cause we come up with some transitions and stuff like that. And they're just so great together. You know, so it's great playing with them. Um, the Gwen band is awesome. We've got a couple guys that, that were in no doubt, like, the, like since the nineties. Oh, that's great awesome. Playing with them. Yeah. Gabriel McNair and Stephen Bradley, they play keys, horns, sing back up. And they, you know, they were in no doubt. Who's the guitar um, player on that gig now? Uh, it's a girl named Lisa Lee, a, okay. a Co- Korean girl. Yeah. She joined with me. Like when we did the, uh, when, when the Vegas residency started, we joined at Very the same cool. time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and obviously like, you know, the guys in the bands that I've played in like the dirty diamond, like Fernando Perdomo, you just had him on, you know, um, love playing with those guys. We have a great time. Uh, the sound check live resident band. Those guys are all great. I don't know if you've had Steve Feckety on the show yet, but he's yeah, the long band guitarist. Ago. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Steve's a great guitar player. Um, yeah, I've been lucky just been, been able to surround myself with some really great musicians, you know, that's cool, man. Yeah. yeah. Knee jerk reaction, top three desert island discs. That's a that's a tough one because there's so many, so many great records. But I, I'd have to say if I had to pick three, Kind of Blue, Miles Davis, uh, Songs in the Key of Life, Stevie Wonder. That's a double album, so that's so that's great. You get a little bonus on that one. <laughs> um, and then another one, I, I would I would say Oh No, it's Devo, 1982. 
Oh, that's a it's first. A, it's a, yeah, it's, I, I'm a huge Devo fan. They're not, they're not really an influence in my music, but I'm just a huge fan. And yeah. I have been since I was a kid. And I remember that album. I got it for Christmas one year, probably 82, um, and just played the shit out of it. And every time I listen to it, it just makes me happy. You know, it's cool. It's got such, such fun tunes on it. Like that's good. And time out for fun and peekaboo and a song called speed racer. It's just like, it's a super fun album. Every time I put it on, I just get a smile on my face. That's so, awesome, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, that's a first. Oh no, it's you. That's a first. <laughs> it's song. not considered. It's not considered a classic, and it's not even considered one of their best albums. Like nobody ever talks about that album. They'll talk about you know, freedom of choice and oh no, it's you. Or um, um, I'm blanking on the Jocko Homo. Is that no, no? no are, are are we not men? They talk about are we that not album. Men? Yeah. You know, duty now for the future. They talk about those albums. You know, but no one, nobody ever talks about oh no, it's Devo. You know, it's one of my favorites. That's the great thing about music, though, man. You know, it's like it doesn't matter what it is. It matters how you feel when you listen to it. Or how Absolutely. It you yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, are you good with balancing time, like uh, between working hard and having fun? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I get antsy, though. Like if I'm not if, if it's kind of like a, a slow period, I start getting antsy, like especially now during this this lockdown. I'm, Kind of and if you're not antsy crazy. now during this lockdown, yeah. there's something wrong with Everybody you. Everybody <laughs> is. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I, I try to, um, yeah, I like a lot of leisure activities. Like I love snowboarding and, and a lot of times like if it's in the winter or spring and I've got downtime, I'm, I'm up in Mammoth or somewhere snowboarding. And I love doing that. I love getting out and hiking the outdoors. Um, so I'd say, you know, I'd say I'm pretty good balancing, balancing all that, but course I could be better at times and and I know my, my wife like a lot of times if I'm home from a tour and it's been a couple weeks she knows that I'm just antsy she knows I'm just chomping at the bit to get playing again you know she'll remind me she's like sit down mellow out like you know like you know you're you're so antsy right now you know? that's cool you, how, I, you just have an anniversary recently or something uh in March yeah yeah man, how long have you been married yeah uh 15 years man congratulations that's a good oh, one thank you thank you yeah that's a long yeah. time good yeah, for you man wow thanks uh, tough question, Dirt. What do you like mm -hmm. most about yourself? Hmm. I like most about myself. Uh, you know, maybe my work ethic. You know, I I generally, um, if I can, you know, step outside and look at myself. Uh, yeah, I think when when I set out to do something, I usually do it. I usually follow through. You know, I think I got that from my dad. You know, he had he's always always had a strong work ethic, and he passed that down to me. That's great, man. Best childhood memory? Um, I don't know if I have if I have any best childhood memories. Like like I said before, I had a great childhood, great family life. You know, um, I don't know if I have one best memory. Uh, I I could bring up one one interesting musical memory. Uh, so yeah. my my first concert ever was Sean Cassidy. Remember him from the yeah, 70s. Yeah, right. My, my sister yeah. was a big fan. My parents took a see him, and I just remember I remember that. I remember like seeing. Sean Cassidy. And uh, many years later, I played his wedding, which was pretty funny. Did you really? You played yeah. Sean Cassidy? Yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't a, get a chance to tell him. I just I didn't want to bother him. Yeah, totally. I was like, man, this was my first concert ever. I didn't want to bother him, but I, I kind of wanted to tell him, I'm like, ask the guy's wedding. I'm not going to be like, you were my first concert. Were you part of a wedding band then that you were playing in? Or like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, used to, I used to do a lot of cover gigs and, and wedding band gigs and stuff like that. You know, and that was probably... You can probably look it up on Wikipedia when his wedding was or something, but I want to say it might have been like around 2003 or something like that. That's really cool. That's wild, man. That you played but yeah, my, my parents, my parents took us to concerts when we were kids. You know, Sean Cassidy, I think, was the first. I think the second was Sean Na. Yeah. And that's interesting too because I, I was a huge fan of the TV show, big Bowser fan, and <laughs> uh, I ended up doing some gigs with Bowser years later. And uh, I had this picture of me doing this, the Bowser thing, you know? Yeah, and yeah. And I, I brought it to him to show him. Like, this is me at five years old pretending <laughs> to be you. <laughs> I'm sure he's that gotten that a lot. Probably, yes. Yeah, so that was kind of interesting, too. Like, you know, and uh, I remember seeing the Beach Boys when I was a kid as well. Like, we used to go to some concerts. So it was cool. some my, good. my parents were into it. Was this all over the country or ver like wherever the various places you guys the, were living? Or? The, that was in Pittsburgh. You know, I remember I was a little kid. And then later on when I got into music i went to concerts that were that were my choice to go to those were just things that my parents were into and brought us you know but that's pretty cool though man yeah yeah absolutely it's funny my uh i i've seen so many shows with my sons and they uh 
now they're older and I realized I'm so happy I did that because they're all like, uh, you know, we saw the Foo Fighters together, a bunch of cool shows, Chris Cornell and Soundgarden. Oh, cool. And, uh, and uh, Awesome. <laughs> they still talk about that now. This is 15, 20 years ago, I think almost. You know, oh, it's wow. real, yeah, I'm really happy I did that the other day when they were, they all want me, they want to get, a, you know, the Foo Fighters FF logo. Mm-hmm. They want me to get a tattoo. Come on, the three of us have to get a tattoo. I have no tattoos. And I'm like, mm, do it. I'm not there yet, man. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Sometime that's I'm funny. like, yeah, that's yeah. Funny. That, that's a band I still have not seen live that I really want to see live. It was an Food amazing Fighters. show. Man, I remember they did an yeah, encore of, uh, I think, Who'll Stop the Rain by John Fogarty. Really? It was, wow. Yeah, it was an incredible, mm. I mean, just the whole awesome. show was great. Man. That's cool. Such a great band incredible man yeah hey tell me something about yourself that people might be surprised to hear or find a little odd um what would they find odd i I think sometimes i'm kind of into like extreme activities and extreme sports and stuff like that i think people have been surprised to hear that like i used to be really into skydiving when i when i was in college i was like shit i used to go skydiving every weekend i was big into that i had a brief uh brief moment with hang gliding. Um, I got really into marathon running for a while. I did 12 full marathons. Uh, Holy really crap. You know what's funny, man? I was one, I said, man, this guy's really good condition. I was curious if you, uh, was that like genetics or you worked out? But, I yeah. wasn't, I was in much better shape then when I was marathoning, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I used to, man, I, I'd be on tour. I'd be training for marathons on tour and I'd be up, you know, five in the morning to do a a 20 mile run before bus call, you know, or like there are times like, like we, if it was like a, you know, tour we're leaving, living on a bus, we'd park at the venue in the morning. I'd get out, do my 20 mile or whatever it was, and then go to sound check and play the gig. You know, like I was crazy with that stuff for a while. And so sometimes (laughs) people that didn't know me when I was doing kind of more extreme stuff, I'll tell them and they're like, wow, I didn't didn't know you had it in you. You know? Yeah. I I went went to Africa years ago. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Like I get into like kind of extreme wow. stuff like that sometimes and I'm kind of a mellow, mellow dude, especially until you really get to know me. And so I, I, I've told people about some of that stuff. They're like, wow, you, you, you don't seem like the type. <laughs> no, I think that's, yeah. I, I think it's great. I, I think it's so important to do physical activities, man, for sure. You know, I it just is a, it keeps you, keeps you young, you know? Yeah. It keeps you, you young. Yeah, totally, man. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah. I get into it. Who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Um, musically, I, I don't know. I, I can't say that I've had like one mentor, you know, some people will say like, you know, they had this mentor. I've just, I've been lucky that I've had so many, I've, I've been able to kind of absorb, um, influence from so many different people that I've worked with, you know, um, cause you know, all the different kinds of gigs I've done over the years, I've worked with a lot of great people and, um, I, I'm just, I'm a really observant guy. I try I try to observe what people do and how they approach things, and if it's and if it's something that I can draw from, you know, if it's something that I can incorporate into my own uh, way of working. So I feel like I just I get influenced one way or another by everybody I work with. Yeah. So I've just been kind of yeah, just trying to trying to soak up whatever I can from all the different musicians I've, I've worked with over the years, and and you know I continue to. You know, That's wonderful, man. Definitely, definitely not done. You know, we're always learning and growing and improving. Um, Are you a reader? Do you read a lot? I do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you mean reader. like read books or or yeah. music reader? No, no, no. Are you, are you a book reader? Um, I'm doing more of that now. I, I used to a, lot, a long time ago, um, and then I went years without really reading many books. Um, and I'm I'm back into it now. Like since we've been in lockdown, I've read a bunch of books. Okay. Uh, some you know some musician memoirs and some science fiction and. What do you like to getting read? Getting back into it. Um, I'm really, I, I've been really into Isaac Asimov. Oh, years. going way back there. Yeah. Yeah. Going back. Like I was really into the foundation series and the, and the iRobot series and all that. Now I'm reading the Galactic Empire, total nerdy stuff. Yeah. Um, but cool. I, I dig science fiction. It's cool. I'm not like a total like expert aficionado, but like if I'm, if I'm reading, I like to read science fiction. It's fun. Yeah. You know, good. So I'm, I'm trying to get back into reading books now. Good. But you do read musically, I guess. Oh yeah, 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 yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's something that's probably I just, skill I developed get. early on. I would imagine that's gotten you a lot of work. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of gigs I've done over the years. I've been reading gigs, like obviously the pop and rock gigs that I do are not 
not reading gigs, but there's a lot of stuff I do in between like sessions or just various gigs around LA that, that have been, that have required sight reading. So that's a definitely a skill I was thankful to learn early on. Yeah. It's one of the biggest regrets. A lot of guys have all musicians of all, you know, bass or, or guitars, even drummers that I wish I read or I wish I read better. Yeah. And a lot of people will say that. And I, I always say it's kind of like, it depends on like, like how, how you came up playing. Like a lot of guys just come up playing in bands and then that'll turn into them being sidemen and doing that. They don't really, they don't really have to read, you know, they're in situations where they, they don't read. I mean, there are a lot of legendary musicians that don't read because they just never had to. Yeah. I just, um, for me, it started in high school. I was, I was in all the, all the, I, when I moved to Cleveland, when my family moved to Cleveland, um, they didn't have any bass players in the music program. So I was the guy. So, oh, so wow. and they didn't really have a lot of low brass either like tubas. So I got thrown into concert band and marching band. I played for all the, I was in the pit orchestra for all the, all the musicals that they did. I was in jazz band and that just like, that got me started on reading. Um, so I just had to, that's all written out, you know? Yeah. Um, and then that turned into me doing more big band stuff. Like I, I, uh, went to a music camp a couple summers and played in big bands, had to read. Um, and I started gigging around Cleveland, like playing musicals and played in like an all state jazz band, big band. And that just, and that just kind of got me started, you know, and, and yeah, the skill I'm, I'm thankful that I learned early on because I, oh, I still yeah. use it to this day. You know, I still get called for some things where the charts put in front of me and yeah thankful that I can, I can, I can read it <laughs> for your solo stuff. Are you putting charts in front of the other guys? Mm -hmm. oh, you I, I think it's, yeah, it, it's just easiest that way. Like that way people, it, it's, it's less homework for people to do. Um, well, they also, it's, yeah. it's crystal clear what you need also. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, for all the projects I do, I always chart everything out. Cause also like you, you can't always count on people to learn this stuff. Like there's a lot of great players in LA, but not everybody, puts homework in, you know, oh, yeah. guys will just show up and kind of skate through stuff. And, um, you know, I just feel like if I've got it on a chart, I'm like, here you go. That's, that's what it is. You know? Yeah. That's your homework. And, Learn it. Yeah. And, and some guys are better readers, readers than others. Like some people can just show up and sight read on a gig. Others, you know, they'll, the chart will help them, but they'll still have to look at it and, and play through it a few times, you know, sure. on their own before showing up. Well, yeah. Yeah. Per, how about personally, who's been the biggest influence on you? Um, Probably just by, you know, my, my, my family, my, my dad, you know, I think I really got my, my work ethic, my work ethic from my dad. Cause he's, um, you know, my dad came from pretty, pretty humble beginnings and really worked his ass off, spent time in the Marines, um, got himself a full ride to an Ivy league college. Uh, wow. Got That's a, impressive, you know, man. Got a, got a, got a master's degree, uh, you know, was in the corporate world, just worked his way up till he was president and then CEO of a major company. Um, so he just really, you know, um, had a strong work ethic and really, uh, succeeded in life, you know, and I think I've just looked at that and I, I just kind of take that from him. So I think that was a bit, big influence. Um, you know, my, my sister as well, she kind of went the same route as my dad, the corporate route and, and did very well, became a vice president of a major, major airline. And I uh, just recently retired. Actually, she retired at age 49. Just pretty what a good time, what a smart yeah. time to retire. <laughs> man, <laughs> sure she was she was a stressful gig right now, man. She was vice president of American Airlines, and uh, Holy she crap. retired in uh, she retired at the end of the year, uh, in De at the end of December. I mean, think about like how the airlines have been struggling and and how much stuff they've had to deal with lately. I was telling her, I'm like, wow, you got out at the like right the time, perfect. Like, couldn't yeah. have picked a better time to get yeah. out. Yeah. Holy crap. That's awesome. And good for her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, biggest business win and biggest personal win so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bit, bit business wins. Um, you know, I feel like every, every gig that I, that I get is, it is a win. Cause you know, I, I came out to LA to, to do what I'm doing now playing, you know, playing with, with big artists on big stages, you know, and doing tours and stuff like that. So I feel like every time I, I audition for a gig and then get offered the gig, that's a, that's a big win. It was a big win uh, with Shania. It was a big win with Gwen. It was a big win with Dancing with the Stars. It was a great big, with, with, big win with Mindy. It's like every time, you know, someone calls and said, said yeah, we want, you to, we want you to be in the band. It's a, it's a huge win. You know, a great, great feeling when that happens. That is a great feeling, man. You know? Congratulations. You know, and, and, and personally, uh, I mean, I think, I think that translates to person personally as well, you know, 
Um, yeah, because it's it's again, it's 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 uh, me doing what I set out to do, and it's 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 accomplishment. It's, it's a feeling of accomplishment. So it's a personal win as well when that happens. Because it's you know, gigs to me, it's it's not just about the money. It's not just about making a living. It's doing what I love to do and getting to do it on a on a bigger scale. You yeah. know, when you when you audition for a gig that's a you know higher profile gig, you know. So that's a, it's, no, it's definitely, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a big personal win as well. You absolutely, know? man. I, I think a lot of, uh, I think there's a good, you got to separate who you are from what you do, but in mm -hmm. the music industry, I think that's very tough because you're, so, it's a creative profession. So yeah, you know, who you are is what you do to a very good yeah. extent. Yeah. With music, it's not, it's never just a job, you know, yeah. it's all, it's, it's always a passion. Even if you're playing somebody else's music, it's still still a, a major passion. You know, it's a, it's a, a dream we've all had since we were kids. Yeah. Uh, favorite place you travel? I know you've been all over the world. Yeah. Uh, definitely New Zealand. Wow. New what do you Zealand like about is, that? That's cool. Oh, it's just beautiful. I mean, just it, all the pictures you've seen and everything you've seen in Lord of the Rings and everything, it really looks like that. Yeah. And uh, the first real experience I had with that was 2010. I was, I was touring with Brian Auger. We did... Uh, an Australia, New Zealand run. And uh, we had, we had played in a town called Tauranga in New Zealand. And then we had three days off before we went to Christchurch. And I'm like, okay, well, I could just hang with the band and go to the next hotel in Christchurch and wander around a city. But, you know, we do that all the time on tours where you're just in a hotel in a downtown area of a city and cities are cities. I'm like, I'm like, I got three days. I, what can I do in New Zealand? So I started looking it up ahead of time, seeing like, what can I see? Where should I go? And found this town called Queenstown, which is kind of like the adventure outdoors adventure capital of New Zealand. It was also home based for a lot of the Lord of the, Ru Lord of the Rings filming. And it's absolutely beautiful. And so I just went there on my own, just like said, okay, I'll meet you guys in Christchurch in a few days. You know, I'm going on my own. And, uh, and actually and one thing that was a trip was I, I flew from Tauranga to, uh, Queenstown. And the thing was a trip was, um, there was no security at the airport. It was there in New Zealand. It was a major airline, but it's like, I just walked in, checked in at the counter. They're like, okay, there's the waiting room. And I'm like, there's no security or anything. Wow. No. So how did I they... thought that was amazing. Yeah. That must've been so refreshing. How do yeah. they... And I guess they don't have any problems because they wouldn't allow it if they had problems. No, I mean, that's the thing about New Zealand. I mean, obviously they had, you know, they had that major shooting a few years back and things have changed. The world has changed over the years and they probably do have security now, but that was 2010. And I just thought it was so cool that like, it was a place that was safe enough that like, you didn't need security at the airport. Like that was so cool. Um, that is amazing. Yeah. That is really cool. Yeah. And, what a and, great yeah. vibe. Yeah, it was cool. And so I just went to Queenstown on my own. I found a, a hotel and um, it's this beautiful town on a lake surrounded by mountains and the lake is just turquoise. It's, it's amazing. And uh, so I went go swimming uh, or boating or fishing. I went canyoning, which was amazing. You, you, you put on a wetsuit, you hike to the top of this canyon, then you make your way down the canyon by um, jumping off of cliffs into the water, sliding down natural water slides, rappelling, just jumping into the water. It's like you're in the water all day, just making your way down this thing and sliding down these little waterfalls. And so I did that, which was incredible. Um, went bungee jumping. It's one of the things you have to do. Oh my in New God. Yeah. So it was off the, it's, it's off their kind of like iconic site. It's this bridge in this gorge where it's like the river is way far down below. I don't even know how many feet or meters it is, but it's like just turquoise, beautiful. And you can tell the guys, like if you want to get dunked in the water, like they, they weigh you ahead of time and they know like how to crank the, 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 um, the bungee cord, you know, they, they ask you, do you want to, do you want to get dunked in the water? Do you want to touch the water? Do you not oh want to get wet God. at all? And so like, I was like, you know what? I want to at least just touch the water and they've got it down to a science. Like I jumped and you know, I'm going, you know, hands first. And it's just like, just my fingertips touched the water before I <laughs> sprung back up. Uh, oh. It was wild. So, oh my like, God. I, yeah. Man. Do you have video that, of that? That is, I do a video. Yeah. It's actually on my YouTube. Yeah. That, that is scary <laughs> as fuck. Just watching that. Oh my God. I'm not that guy. Oh my, my two, my older son and my daughter, my youngest, my daughter went skydiving recently. I just freaking out watching the video. I was like, no, oh my God, that's yeah, really yeah. ballsy to do that. But, Holy shit. Good but I, I did bungee, bungee jumping like way after I was, I was a skydiver. So like the heights didn't bother me. You know, I'd already jumped out of a plane a hundred times, but, um, I, honestly, like, bungee jumping was scarier than skydiving to me because you're, it's just so much more real. 
you're like right there on the platform and you're looking <laughs> at the ground below and they're like, okay, jump. <laughs> you know, what, what, like when you're in a plane, you're that far above the ground where it's just unfathomable. It doesn't even seem real. But I mean, with bungee jumping, you're not that far off. Like, you know, if you, <laughs> something goes oh. wrong. You're just, a, you're just a few seconds away from, you know, going splat. <laughs> Did you like so was a little call scary. your wife before you, hon, I just want you to know. I'm, I like, told her after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. tell her before. And same thing when I, when I first went skydiving, I called my mom and told her after. I didn't yeah. tell her before because I didn't want them to worry. So it was, Holy it was the same crap. thing with, with bungee jumping. I called her. I was like, uh, I did something today. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Wow. Good for you, man. So let me ask you a question. When you go down this, like you jump into the falls, this is a stupid question. Probably. I'm sure it is, but I'm going to ask you, where do you put all the shit you have with you? Like, do you have a bag? So or is, like, they, they give you a locker. Yeah. I mean, probably every place is different, but this place is like, I mean, they're doing one after the other all day long. It's like an iconic thing in New Zealand. And I mean, it's just such a professional operation. Like mm. you go in this little, little sort of office place, you know, and get a locker, put all your stuff, empty your pockets, put it all in the locker, weigh in, and then you just go get in line. And I mean, it's just like one person after the other. And how do you get back up to the top? Uh, there's somebody with a boat down below and they like, after you, you know, go down and up and down and up and whatever, then, then they, uh, they lower you into the boat and the guy in the boat unhooks you and then they take you to shore. Wow. That is yeah. wild, man. It was cool. Holy crap. What a nice, Super that fun. sounds like a fantastic trip. Yeah. It was like a great three days. Um, another fun thing down there was, uh, they have this thing called sledging. It's, uh, basically boogie boarding down whitewater rapids in a river. And I did that. It's like, you have this boogie board that has handles on it. And you're just like in this river that's just crystal clear, just beautiful. And you're just cruising down the river, like on this boogie board. That sounds white, cool. Whitewater rapids. And it's like, they, they do all kinds of stuff like that there. And it's, it's just beautiful. The people are super friendly. Like, you know, Kiwis have that reputation. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, New, New Zealand. I've been there a few times now. That, that, that was the first experience I had. And I was down there with Air Supply. We did a tour down there a while back. Um, I went there on a vacation with my wife. You know, I was going to say, did you get to go out there well. with your wife? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, she came out 2014. We did a, we did a vacation there. That's nice. Um, yeah, it's my favorite place in the world. Yeah, Very it's great. cool, man. Hey, uh, three more questions. Uh, best okay. advice you've ever been given, Derek, and who gave it to you? Best advice... Um, I remember uh, I used to do, you know, a bunch of gigs around town with like some more experienced musicians when I first moved to town. And um, I was kind of like the young new guy. And I remember once playing a gig and, uh, and, and after the set, the, the drummer kind of me, goes, he goes, man, just, just play the groove, man. I was like, what am I, am I not playing the groove? He's like, he's like, man, you're playing all this extra shit that has nothing to do with the song. Like just play the groove. I was like, okay. It stuck with me. And I, it's like in my mind, I thought I was, but like, Back in the back in those days, I was kind of like a fusion guy, and I played, you know, probably played so many more notes than I needed to, you know, and uh, and that was like just something that stuck with me. And it's like, yeah, as a bass player, that's the most important thing: play the groove, you know. And and I I would listen back to recordings of myself back then, and, and I'm like, yeah, I played a lot of unnecessary notes, you know. Just and I just, I just remember like that's such a simple thing to say to somebody, but like that's the best advice you can give to 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 any bass player or drummer: just just play the groove. You know, and he, he's a guy I don't really play with much anymore. I, I've run into him a couple of times, but like he probably wouldn't even remember it. He's a guy named Sergio Gonzalez, drummer, great drummer. And we used to do these wedding gigs together. Um, I used to work for this like wedding band agency called West Coast Music. And they basically put together, you know, some of the best musicians in town and the form of these wedding bands. Yeah. Great musicians. So I got to play with a lot of really great people. Um, he was a drummer. I played with a bunch and, um, yeah. And I was just, you know, kind of like the young and experienced guy, you know, and, uh, I just remember him saying that and I just kind of gave it some thought like, okay, I thought I was playing the groove, but maybe I'm not like, what does that mean to just play the groove? And uh, yeah, just kind of stuck with me. And now you're getting ready to make a groove album. So you, you must have paid attention to the advice. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Biggest change in your personality over the last seven to 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much has just been a natural part of aging? Uh, I think I've, I've learned to just relax and let go and trust the universe a little bit more. You know, I, I feel like I always used to kind of overanalyze things and I probably still do it, you know, on some level, but I, I've learned to just to relax a little bit more. Um, 
and just let things happen. I, I've, I've learned over the years that like the universe does take care of you and, and things do happen for a reason. And, you know, there are times when like I wanted a gig and I didn't get the gig and I'd be so bummed about it. But then years later, I, I, I could see why I didn't get the gig. I didn't get that gig because this other gig came up that was great. And it was a great fit for me. And, you know, I've had a lot of those kind of experiences where I was bummed when something didn't happen that I wanted to happen. And then years, years or months or even weeks later, I would see that that didn't happen for a reason because something else happened instead. Yeah. You know, and I've, I've, and the more experiences I've had like that, the more I've just learned like, okay, yeah, we need to just kind of like trust that, that the universe has a, has a plan for us, you know? Yeah. Um, mm. So I've, I've just learned to kind of let go a little bit more and, and not overthink things and not be too eager. I, I look back at how I approached a lot of things back in the day. And I think I was just, just way too eager about things. You yeah. Know? Willful. Um, and, and you, yeah, and you just got to kind of, kind of do your thing and, and trust that, uh, that the pieces will fall into place. You know, uh, I had this conversation yeah. with a buddy of mine sometime over the last year. And, um, the way he put it was, he goes, don't be part of the results committee so much, <laughs> you know, just, results committee. Yeah. yeah. Don't be, don't be a member of the results committee. Just do what you got to do. And whatever happens, trust that it's, a, you know, the right thing to happen. Yeah. Yeah, for kind of sure. Like you're like, you didn't get the gig, trust that it was a reason why you didn't get the gig or something. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And, 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 you know, like I was saying before, I like to look back and, and try to figure out why and figure out what I could do different, how I could improve. But, um, but, you know, I've learned to not really overthink it too much, you know, look at kind of the basic outline of, of, of what I, how I can improve on something, but uh, not really obsess over it, you know? Yeah. Cause you never really know. And a lot of things are out of your control too, you know? Yeah, most things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, completely, yeah. So, yeah, I've just learned to kind of relax a little bit more about just everything in life in general, you know? Good, man. Yeah. Uh, last question, most important lesson you've learned in life, and that might have been it. Yeah, I mean, that's probably, that's probably it, you know? Uh, I think those last two things incorporate that. Like the most, the most important lesson in music is, yeah, just play the groove, and the most important thing lesson in life is just uh is, is yeah just let go relax trust the universe do the best you can do and uh yeah trust that uh that things work out the way they're supposed to well man you are a total professional i really appreciate uh your time and you could tell like i just thanks man you really gotta you know you're very practical about things and I can just tell you very serious about your work ethic, which is great. So absolutely. Um, let me tell people where they could check you out. Uh, first of all, it's Derek Frank, D E R E K Frank, uh, Derek, any, um, I know it's probably early, any like tentative name for the solo project? Well, it'll, it'll just be under my name. I don't have an album title yet. Album, sorry. I meant an album title. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't, I don't have that yet. Um, sledging. Yeah, right right <laughs> yeah um i i'm hoping that, that everything works out the way i want it to and that i'll be able to release something in august or september i right mean on. of course like the way things are now we don't know when we can get back to playing together and gathering and all that so you know we'll, we'll see how it all plays out I, again it's one of those things i got to relax about and let the universe yeah, take care man. of it you know so i can't put an, an absolute release date yet uh but you know, I, I, I'm pretty active on uh, social media like Instagram and, and Facebook, and I always keep my website pretty updated. Yeah, your website's know. great. Actually. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's so, very, very clear. So let me tell people where they can find these things. It's Derek Frank, uh, uh, DerekFrank.com. On Instagram, it's Derek Frank Base. You mentioned a YouTube channel. What do you got on there? Yeah, I, I need to be better about my YouTube. I've got a few things on my YouTube, but I, I don't keep it regularly updated. I think I'm, as far as posting videos and stuff, I, I'll post more stuff on Instagram than YouTube. I, I think once I start doing my own thing again and recording, I'll, I'll have more of my own videos that I can put up on YouTube. Okay. But there is some stuff up there. I think, um, yeah, I think if you just search my name on YouTube, Derek, Derek Frank Bass, I think my actual channel is D Frank Bass. I think it's just awesome. D Frank Bass. Yeah. So check out but, D, D yeah. Frank Bass on YouTube and subscribe to Derek's channel. Uh, also, okay, so solo record pending sometime this year um, with Jim Scott producing. It's going to be an instrumental groove record. Dirty Diamond. You want to talk about that band that you're in with Fernando yeah. and a couple other cool guys? Yeah. So yeah, the Dirty Diamond is, um, 
it's a it's it's a band I'm in. It's not like my band, but it's a band I'm in. Have been in for a few years. Uh, my close friend Shay Godwin is the drummer. He's the one that initially brought me into it. Um, Fernando Perdomo is the guitarist, and Sam Babayan is the uh, lead singer and, and main songwriter. Uh, it's a really fun band. It's like a you know kind of a rock thing with psychedelic under undertones. Um, really great musicians. Um, so we just put out a record early uh, end of last year. Um, it's called From the Stars, and then we put out an acoustic um, complement to that called To the Stars. Uh, oh. But Dude, yeah, we Fernando's in. Got you'll have like twelve records out in the next you know three or four years. <laughs> he is so prolific. He's always releasing something. He just released his Yacht Rock album, and then yeah. he's got his Out to Sea prog records. He's got like three of those now. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's always writing and recording. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a super talented, yeah, hard worker. Uh, but yeah, super fun band. We we do shows every now and then. It's um. It just shows around LA. We play, we play the Troubadour. We play the Hotel Cafe. No show scheduled now, but uh, but it's a really fun rock band. Yeah, very cool. And also, uh, if you're headed to Vegas, check out Shania or Gwen Stefani. Once life comes back to uh, us as we know it, and yeah. uh, Derek also does uh, Skype lessons. So if you're interested in that, go to him. Go to his website, DerekFrank.com. There's a place you could connect with him on there. Go to the contact tab. He has information about his lessons. Uh, any particular kind of any things going on in your lessons that like, you know, where you have an expertise or you want to, you know, promote or. It's uh, it, it just depends on the student. I mean, it's all kind of custom tailored to what the student wants. I mean, usually when people hit me up for lessons, it's cause they already know who I am and what I do and they have specific questions. So, um, yeah, I'm just here to help them with whatever they need, need help with, you know, whether it's technique, whether it's sometimes it's even like, we're, we're not even playing. It's just like career counseling kind of things. They're I would like, see you being really good with that, actually. That's what I was thinking. That, that's kind of mainly what I do. Like when I do clinics, it's mainly on, on career. It's like, how do you, how do you, you know, have a career as a bass player? How do you make a living as a bass player? How do you get plugged into a scene? How do you get gigs? That's kind of like what my, what my clinics are about. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times when people hit me up for lessons, it's more about that than it is about, about playing. Good. Um, yeah, because I'm not like some technical wizard, you know. I mean, I, I whatever I've gotten. No, but that being said, man, play, you're, but, you're yeah. a, a sight reader with a you know 25 year plus career doing this. Graduated University of Miami. That's like one of the top music schools in the country, man. So I mean, mm-hmm. you have that in your pocket for sure, man. Sure. So anyway, yeah. if you're a bass player and you want to make uh, any of those talents available to you, go to DerekFrank.com and connect with Derek. And um, I think that's about it. anything else I've left out or anything else you want to uh, promote or talk about. Not really. Not really. This was a fun conversation though, man. I, Thank I, you. I, as, as I've said, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I've heard many <laughs> of my friends on it. So man, it was, it was an honor to, to chat with you for a while. Oh, likewise. Very much, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for everything. Hang on one second. I'll wrap this up. And then yeah, you and cool. I can chat for a minute. All uh, right. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Derek Frank. Again, check out Derek online, DerekFrank.com. If you're a bass player and you're looking for some, you know, either guidance as in your bass career or actual lessons, hit them up there as well. Uh, Shania uh, and Gwen Stefani, my wife's dying to go out to Vegas, so I might. <laughs> Man, come on I'll out, hit, hit me up I'll anytime. Hit you guys. <laughs> I know enough of Man, you guys. Who comes? I'll have. Show. I'll. I'll get you tickets. No problem. Thank you so much. Uh, if, go check out Shania and Gwen Stefani on, on all the bands. There, are, I mean, these guys have great bands. You know, they're. You know, Shania and Gwen have put both great bands together, yeah, sure. and uh, hit up Derek Frank Bass on Instagram and on his YouTube channel. It's DF Bass. And most important, especially nowadays, man, remember that happiness is a choice. So please choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or your bass and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Derek, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it.